Want to welcome everyone back to a new school year. We're really excited and uh, about all the opportunities that's going to happen for our students and our staff and our uh, our community. So we're going to go ahead and start with the opening. Let's call the um, call to order. Uh, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. If we, if Dr. Marsden, could you do that, please? Thank you. Be my pleasure. Please stand and join me in the pledge. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We heard an echo. Okay, next on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Okay, do you have any, any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and uh, call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. Motion carried. 1.4 inspirational message by Mr. Michael Gallo. Thank you, Madam President. I, uh, I'm going to ask the guys to put up a quote. This is actually my favorite quote. It's by Teddy Roosevelt. And, uh, and I, I kind of entitled it, Dare to be Great. But if you pay attention to the words, this is... Um, uh, both biting but also challenging when you think about it. And you can kind of think of what type of person you are by, you know, what's being characterized through here. And I think, you know, as we open up a new year, I would challenge you to, uh, you know, dare to step out there for our students. Uh, don't be afraid of what others are telling you. Don't let them tell you, tell them you can't. Figure out a way to do it. And uh, if it's for the right thing, uh, will be championing you and, and helping you along the way. So I'm just going to read this. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, valiantly who errs, who comes short again and again, because there's no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. And that's Teddy Roosevelt, 1910. So I'd, uh, I'd just um, challenge you to, you know, take these words of perseverance. And, uh, um, you know, th it's hard to be out there doing stuff. And I'm telling you, you'll have critics uh, saying you can't, you shouldn't, you, uh, you won't, and don't believe them because you can if you want. So that's my inspirational reading for the day. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Wow. Gallo, for sharing that. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and move to closed session. This is where we will be um, back there for, uh, which is described there. I'm trying to move through my notes here. And there's no public comments? Okay. All right, we will be coming back. Thank you. Uh, we're back, and we do have a quorum, so I'm going to go ahead and read what came out of closed session. Be resolved that the Board of Education approves the appointment of the following employee, Ramirez Aldo, Director of Continuous Improvement, Educational Services, Effective Date, Work Year, and Salary to be Determined, Funding 031. Congratulations. Congratulations. I want to read all three. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, I see Should I read all three and then we can approve at the end? And then Momberger. Yes. Yeah, so Momberger, Douglas Middle School, Vice Principal, Richardson Prep High Middle School. Effective date, work year, and salary to be determined, funding 035. And Slaughter Danita, Elementary School, Vice Principal, Hunt Elementary School. Effective date, work year, and salary to be determined, funding 035. Can I have a motion? Any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Okay, motion carried and congratulations. And yeah, 
Congratulations. And I know we have uh, Mr. Ramirez here. And are any of other uh, folks here that were uh, mentioned this evening? OK, not yet. Well, we also uh, have a couple of folks with us that are on borders tonight. Uh, James Soward, who is the uh, middle school vice principal at Shannon Hills. Is, is James in the audience? No? OK, thought he might be. No? And then uh, Jenny Page, middle school principal. Congratulations, Richardson Prep. You can see her in the back here. So congratulations and welcome this evening. That's it. Okay. Okay, great. So now we're moving to 3.0 action reported. Um, oh, that's the one I just did right now. So 4.0 public hearing. 4.1 initial contract proposal. Reopener from the California School Employees Association and it's chapter 183. No public comments on that, uh, on the public hearing. Okay. Don't we, right here? Do I go ahead and read it? Yeah, right, but there's a vehicle zone. We do vote, do okay. Here. So, okay, so I don't have that one. All right, let's go. Okay, yes, Dr. Flores. I really, uh, I love this because at the end it says tuition reimbursement uh, committee, and that's board where we're um, reimbursing our classified employees on their quest to becoming teachers. And so I, I think this is really, I think we're novel in the whole state. Uh, and uh, as we grow our own, I think that, uh, and that's what we got the Golden Apple Award for. I think a, a lot more districts are going to be doing this and will be the, the model for other districts. So I'm proud of that, and I'm proud of our classified because they're, they have committees and, and are doing it um, you know, the right way. All right, thank you. So then, uh, be it resolved that the Board of Education receive the initial contract proposal, reopener from the California School Employees Association and its Chapter 183, CSEA. I have a motion? Is there a second? Okay, any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, motion carried. 4.2 initial contract proposal successor from the San Bernardino School Police Officers Association. Dr. Marston? No public comments. Okay. Any, any board discussion? Okay, let's just be resolved that the Board of Education receives the initial contract proposal successor from the San Bernardino School Police Officers Association. Can I have a motion? Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, let's go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Okay, motion carried. 5.0 student achievement, 5.1. Key performance indicator and attendance, sub suspension, expulsion data, and citations update 2017 and 2018. Dr. Morrison. Thank you, Madam President, and good evening, board. This is one of your key performance indicators, and tonight's uh, presentation covers key data in relation to student behavior and attendance. Uh, we appreciate the board's clear direction to expand youth court uh, and attendance recovery programs and your support for the professional development of staff in cultural proficiency. As you know, many of these actions take time to bear fruit. However, I am proud to announce a very significant decline for African American students in suspensions and citations uh, overall for all students. A lot of positive work has been done, a lot of work still yet to do. Uh, throughout this presentation, you will hear the format tonight after a brief overview of the data in each area. You'll hear about the particular strategies and solutions used to see better outcomes for our students. And then after you've heard about these actions to decrease suspension or citation expulsion rates or increase attendance rate, you'll go into a deeper dive in the data. I want to thank President Medina and Dr. Wyatt for their advice to make sense of all the data. It's a complex topic with a lot of moving parts. Uh, but as we do this work in this area, I want to thank them for their leadership. And as a reminder, there will be an opportunity for questions and further direction from the board at the end of the presentation. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lorraine Perez and our two guests, Marlene uh, Vikendova and Steve Donahue, our Assistant Chief of Police. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marston. Good evening, board. 
and cabinet, um, through the collaboration between business services, educational services, our police department and student services, we're bringing forward this information related to uh, our attendance, suspension, expulsion, and citation. This is definitely a collaborative effort as Dr. Marsden uh, mentioned earlier, it takes efforts on behalf of, of our entire team to move these dials. And so the presentation that the team um, will share with you tonight um, will outline the progress that we've made and our direction moving forward. So um, as described with me tonight, I have Marlene Vikendover, our Director of Youth Services, and uh, Steve Donahue, our Assistant Chief. And we will also um, have a couple of principals who will come up and share some information related specifically to their school site. Those two principals are Keisha Handy, the principal at Cole Elementary, and Tony Woods, the principal at Del Vallejo Middle School. So our outcomes for tonight's presentation are to review the data and trends regarding attendance, suspension and ex expulsion, and citations, as well as sharing the strategies for improvement that are in place or are in development. Good, af good afternoon. We'll begin with this attendance overview, so I'll allow you to look at that data. But as you can see, average daily attendance pretty much remained consistent. We ended at 49.9% for our average daily attendance. And then chronically absent students, we had a slight increase by 1.4%. And we'll speak to that a little bit later. So moving to the next slide. Attendance improvement strategies. So I wanted to share that a couple of things that we'll be doing in addition to all the work that's been going on last year. Um, in particular, number one, we for tier one, so this is the school-wide level, one of the big things that we started last year was we began recognizing schools on a regular basis. So this was happening at site leaders meetings, that type of thing. So we really want to develop the incentives for those schools in terms of a lot of them are creating very uh, innovative programs and processes for their tier one strategies, and we're starting to see some improvement in those areas, as the two ladies tonight will show, or two principals will show tonight. In addition, we also worked with human resources this year, and we are now making sure that we are hiring uh, people who represent the community that we serve. We really, really want to make sure that those people who are going out to sites can really um, have shared experiences with our community, and they can really service them appropriately. In terms of Tier 2 and Tier 3, we did begin last year bringing hope to Saturdays. Some of you may know this as the ARC program as well. So on the back end of getting kids to school, we involved 21 schools, and we were able to recover 6,387 days. So this is ADA, and this is funds coming back to the sites in order, and site money that can ultimately be used to improve attendance at a Tier 1 level as well. Yes. So. The, the, the gross amount we recovered was 507958 $507,000 for the um, 6,387 kid days. It was almost, almost 80 mm -hmm. ADA, so it was quite significant. A half a million dollars, and that was just Saturday. We own, and we only Saturday ran the pro schools, yeah. I, I have a question about summer school because I know we had also summer school, correct? That, that doesn't go Not for that. recovery? Oh, okay. And I know that you have um, still will be reviewing the rest of it, and then if we can try to hold the questions, because if you can, um, obviously this just, because I know it's a long presentation. Absolutely, thank you. And just, we just wanted to point out and hope to Saturdays that we only, uh, we began it in January, so that's only for half a year. So we know we'll get bigger results this coming school year as well. Yes, correct from January through June, I believe. And did you say a pilot at, w at what, only elementary level? Is that what you said? No. Is yes. there, is, there is a middle school involved. Okay. So we pilot it with the 21 schools, and we have some systems to create, and then we can expand from there. Madam, yes. Madam President, I, sometimes we, I can't wait till the end, because well, it's, really, it, yeah, it, it's really crucial, just really quick. I, wanna, I won't go on and on. But that's really significant, only 21 schools. And if we were to do it at all our schools, that would generate a tremendous uh, you know, recap. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that at the okay. end. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. if you want to jot your questions down, we can go back. I know, it. but sometimes it's, sure. 
like yeah, it takes you forget. Okay. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. And the last thing that we're also adding to to improve our strategy or improve our attendance is wraparound supports for especially the tier, what would I consider tier three students who have um, severe chronic absentee issues. What I'm doing is uh, we coordinated with Aldo's office in terms of the community, community health education workers. We're actually using those workers that come from Loma Linda to really support our, our very um, challenged families that, that need extra support. They each will be carrying cases caseloads of about 30 uh, students each or 30 families each. And that what that's going to do is going to allow the attendance workers or the attendance verifiers and recovery specialists in my department to now serve a broader amount of students, um, especially those that are bordering on becoming chronically absent. So we really want to try to prevent them from hitting that 10 percent absentee, absentee mark. So now we're getting to do more work um, that is forward thinking or being more proactive because we have extra supports supporting the high end, the, the high need kids. Madam, Madam President. Yes. Just, I know because just the, there's a lot of different subjects in here. So I just want to make sure that, um, that I say for the record that on page three where you have the chronically absent students increased by 1.4%. The increase is actually big. If, if it went from 16.4% to 17.8%, the increase is bigger than a 1.4%. It's like a it's like a 8% increase. If you look at the, the change between 16.4 to 17.8, that's an 8% change. And I think I'm it's critical. Okay. I think it's critical to say that because it's one thing to say you have. It almost gives you the impression that you have a 1% increase. It's not a 1% increase. Yes. I, I see what you're saying. So the increase is not a 1.4%. We went up 1.4 from 16.4% to 17.8%. Which is, eight, is And it should be noted because it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. And we should be looking at where the increase is at and what tools we can use Mr. to- Mr. Tillman, which page were you looking at that we're not three. seeing? That? Page three. No, page three, but you're looking at a different page in order to look no, at that. No, If you look at page three, page three states that it went from 16.4% to 17.8%. The yes. way it reads, it says chronically absent students increased by 1.4%. It's really an 8% increase. If you look at the change between 16.4% okay. and 17.8, you're right. When you do the subtraction, it's 1.4, but just take that 1.4 and divide it by 16.4 to give you the change. So the change is an 8% increase. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yes, you're, you're correct. I agree. Okay, mo moving to this next slide, you see the period two average daily attendance, and you can see uh, all the various years at, all the way down to 2013. So I'll just let you look at that. We stayed pretty consistent with the previous year, this point, 94.9. This graph, this next graph shows uh, the period two attendance, so that's the end of the year. Again, average daily attendance, and this is by grade level, so you can kind of see the different grade levels and continuation high school is on the last on the end okay. and this this one is the chronically absent students by grade level One of, we did discuss, well, why is this happening? Why did the chronically absent students increase? And one of the things that we discussed was this past year, there has been a tremendous amount of work around this particular issue. And one of the things that we have gotten better at is defining for sites and for everyone involved what is chronically absent. And so often what we think is occurring is that now we're properly identifying which kids are chronically absent. So now that we have what we feel is a better baseline, we can probably measure growth from this baseline that that's exists for this past school year. Okay. Moving forward, we hope to really make a huge difference, especially with the strategies and all the work that went on for last year. I would like to know uh, which kids have health problems like, like asthma. Uh, you know, all the different aspects. I mean, it's just not enough to say chronically absent, but what are the circumstances? And so thank you for that question. That's actually exactly what we were talking about. So we're putting 
creating and putting systems in place so that we are able to track that. So we're pulling and partnering with our um, different departments better. I was speaking with our health services this morning and talking exactly about that. When we can identify who those students are, that we're able to provide that wraparound support and service to the family related specifically to the reason for their chronic absence, whether that's asthma or other things. And here we have the, the chronically absent students by program groups. And I'll let you look at that for a second. Did we pass the ethnicity, the race ethnicity, ethnicity one? Did we talk about that did one? We? Maybe I just, there you go. There you go. Okay, we can address this one first. So chronically absent students by race, race and ethnicity. One thing we did want to point out Okay, that, move to the next one. No, I don't, I don't have any notes. Sorry, I didn't have any notes on that one. I apologize. This one is chronically absent students by program groups. So we have English learners, um, special ed, that type of program. That's what we mean by that. And now we're moving on to suspensions and expulsion overview. So you can see here hey, that before we move to the, the suspension expulsions, Absolutely. I do want to ask if any board members have any questions regarding the chronic um, absent students before we move on to expulsions and suspensions Madam President. or attendance. Mr. Tillman? Yeah, it, it's, it, I mean, it, the numbers, um, and thanks for presenting the numbers tonight, but when you look at the larger groups, when you look at the African American community, I mean, you went from 27% to for 23 percent to 27 percent so i mean that's definitely a, a area area of concern because again that's a, a a large rather large increase in the chronically absent so i guess at some point um yeah. we should i think we should have a presentation just on uh chronic absenteeism and talk about some of the things we're doing to um, minimize those numbers you know, I, I know we had a i know um Ms. Linda Hart did a program last year, and she was telling me some of the reasons why um, students didn't come to school, and it's a wide range of things, but I think we should have the discussion here at the district, so maybe there's some um, uh, things we can implement to either, I know some of us students being afraid to walk through different neighborhoods, so maybe we can um, calculate that in, and when we're doing the outreach, be able to either transfer those students or provide transportation if that's a uh a ongoing big problem um so and i and, and i and i guess even to evaluate some of the programs i know miss hart did the program last year she's not doing it this year but if we have results that were uh positive then i think it should behoove us when we look at these numbers to try to um do outreach and keep those programs going if they made a difference um, because this is a, a huge problem, and, not, and, not, and I don't even care about the money part of it. For me, it's just the, the human part of it, mm -hmm. and we have students that aren't coming to school, and if we reach out to them, we can find solutions and ways to get them to our school, and the sooner we do it, the better off we are. Well, thank you, Mr. Tillman, and we also want to incorporate, there's also add Pacific Islanders, American Indian, and if you notice, everyone has increased slightly, except for the population. <coughs> Uh, Filipino population. And, and the only reason why I singled out African Americans because if you look at the numbers, they represent yeah. 6,297 so compared to, I'm not saying it's um, not an issue for 199 students, but you're talking about a much larger population of students, and that's the biggest population of students mm -hmm. that has the highest increase. So right. that's the reason why I say we definitely got to target that population. Okay. And, uh, Dr. Flores? Uh, yes, and right now this is averages for everybody. And I would like it disaggregated, disaggregated by uh, elementary, middle school, and high school. Because what Mr. Tillman is saying about, uh, you know, walking to school, and that may be an, er uh, an area of concern. Again, I'm really concerned with health, with the health. And also, I'm concerned, and I, I really uh, appreciate uh, 
Mrs. Hart's, Ms. Hart's presentation. Uh, I don't know how many board meetings ago, but she, um, you know, uh, was very comprehensive in uh, telling us uh, why they were not coming and the solutions behind it, and then the, you know how she outreached to the parents and to the child, and um, you know they figured it out, and that's what we need to do in terms of getting our kids to school. Um, and I think her her program was very comprehensive. It was the beginning, mm -hmm. and I believe she's a social worker, so she was able to connect you know our families uh, to. Um, the wraparound services that you guys are wanting to do as well. So I think that would be really, really important. And, um, you know, again, the numbers, uh, you know, they have to be disaggregated so that we know uh, because it, it just washes it out when you average everything. So the two points I've heard so far, and, you know, after staff does, as you heard, wants to do a deeper dive, this is right. kind of our first stab at this right. effort. We're got, we've gotten better at taking attendance counting. Uh, we weren't doing as good of a job of really collecting data on who are our chronically absent, so this is our good baseline for us. Um, and now we will begin building a presentation to look at just the chronically absent, to look at programs that have served them in the past, and then, as Dr. Flores mentioned, to disaggregate data by both race and school level. You have school level separately from race, and you have race separately right. from school level, but what I'm hearing you say is also disaggregate that. And, and gender. Race. And gender. Thank I think right. gender is huge. Thank you. We can, Thank you. we can do that. And Ms. Rogers, you had a question? Yeah, and I also wanted to just comment on, I know we use the word wraparound services, and you know we need to identify what those are because it's important to know that just one type of wraparound service does not fit across the board, and that's why we always ask for the data to be broken out so that we can get in the habit of seeing, you know, where is the, 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 the biggest problems and then why are we having them and what are we doing? Are we addressing them the exact same way? And when we have this true partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health, you will see that that is just how they operate when providing services and needs to individuals. And that's one of the reasons why Ms. Hart is able, that's just, just her expertise in that area, because it's not trying to do a one size we have this one type of service and then we're going to give it and hopefully they come. There's different reasons why they're not coming and we have to dig into that. And so hopefully when you bring the presentation, show us what you are doing versus what we want to do. We want to see that too. What, what are we doing and then what do we need to add and where are we missing right. it? Okay, and Anna, I wanted Dr. to Flores. add, uh, Madam President, that and also recommend that, you know, when you put the percentages, it should also be the raw number of the percentage. For African Americans, 27.3 uh, is 1,700 children. That's a lot of children. For Latino, 16.1 of 40,743 is 6,518. That's a lot of children. And so we need to have those numbers. I don't know how you do it, but I guess you guys have to figure out how to do that. But that, we need the raw numbers, not just the percentages. I mean, I can calculate it really fast, but it would be nice to see it when you present it. Right. And we, we do right. have some of that information for you here, and we can share that with you. Um, but you're right, the, the slides, getting all of that information on there, Dr. Flores, makes it um, a little clouded with the rest of the information that's there. All right, thank you. When we attempted to put raw data in there, it was very difficult to read, but we do have it for you, um, the raw numbers. So now we're moving into the suspensions and expulsions? Okay. Yes. Okay. Before we move on to, um, before we move on. Yes. Um, and this is to Dr. Hill. Dr. Hill on page seven. Is that normal to have um, absent? Absent, chronic absenteeism among continuation high schools, is that? And I guess, Scott, to um, Dr. Wyatt, you know us. Well, it is for a multitude of reasons. Uh, one, a number of those students are working, mm -hmm. and a number of those students are working evenings. And I think with having a morning and evening program, uh, and with the um, transfer in, you know, it's, it's a revolving door at the alternative schools. So you just don't get them in September and they're there until June. 
you know, you, you might have 300 in September. By December, you might have 300, but maybe only 100 of the original 100 who was there. So and depending on what's going on uh, with them, whether it's uh, uh, juvenile hall student, or where it could even be a jail incarcerated student. So, so uh, my, my, well, my, you're making up a point. Should, should those students be considered chronically absent, though? I, personally, I don't think so. Right. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they should be part of the mix. And, and yeah, that's it's one a of state the state definition. So, oh, it is. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're. So we haven't looked at. I don't. I don't think we've ever had a look at chronically absent data point since the state said now you will look at chronically absent that's why it's new for us yeah and and it's state that i'm getting not i mean that's that's what happened the state right. says you need to measure chronically absent students so now we're doing that this is our first year doing that we're getting good at doing that so what you see in front of you is actually baseline even though you have three years of data because yeah. we went back because we want you to see a trend. Right. So when we get the presentation, then maybe we should get the definition of what chronic right. absenteeism is. Also. And Dr. Hill, could you explain more your idea about about different uh, cycles for the kids or having like what you said? Well, when I was at San Andreas, I would bring students in every like three weeks or six weeks, something to that extent. But I think now again with the changes at the state level they bring them in every day or every other day mm -hmm. and most of the students you're going to get at sierra and i would say uh also m most of the ones you get at san andreas these are students who are not attending to begin with mm -hmm. so right. so the pattern is going to follow them from the traditional school that they've been taken from. so you're recommending that we uh make policy to accept them on a daily basis uh, no, I'm not recommending that because that that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, what are you that's, recommending? That's quite a uh, a task so, uh, your task for the teaching staff. Mm. I I don't know if it's going to get any better. Right. You know, our students are who we get. Right. And uh, the traditional schools are not sending the students who come every day. Right. They'll send sending the ones they haven't seen in a week or two or three. Mm -hmm. And they aren't going to change the pattern because they're going to San Andreas or Sierra. Right. They're going to change the pattern when things are meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. and, and they do. And that's why, I mean, I know the state <coughs> is the one in charge, but I still don't support that this has to be part of our accountability because not only is it unfair, it's, it's, it's impossible. Right. It's impossible to you know, give a good, accurate uh, uh, assessment of what's happening in our district with attendance. Right. Okay, thank you. And then, and then, board, if you could, at the top of page, slide nine, and it's actually at the top of all the slides on chronically absent, the state's definition is there on chronically absent. There's a lot of information on these slides. Yeah, I but saw that. If you yeah. see this, the state has defined a chronically right. absent student as a pupil missing 10% or more of the school year, whether absence is excused or unexcused. So just, okay. to, just to clarify. And Mr. Gallo has a comment, but I do want to mention that it's 7 o'clock. So for those that have public comments, if you can just uh, be a little patient and let us finish the presentation. Before and I'll make mine uh, quick. Um, we've seen engagement of our students to be a real driver in attendance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the date is early, but at San Andreas, you know, we've, we've – uh, created some unique pathway opportunities for some of these kids. And um, uh, I, know the, I know the principal is putting together these stats on attendance and, uh, and looking at this from who's in the pathway, you know, and who, um, who haven't signed up for a pathway. And I, just knowing the kids that I've seen there, we see kids who never came coming every day. So it's anecdotal right mm -hmm. now, but the data is being collected. Right. And so I think we're going to see some proof. I mean, that's the whole point of what we're doing, right? And when we try uh, putting these interventions in place, I mean, the goal is to have the data to back it up. So, mm -hmm. um, and when you read, you know, what Gallup has said, you know, inspiring kids and engaging them is, are the two critical uh, elements that uh, determine, you know, whether or not a student's going to attend. So. All right. Well, thank you so much. So then we can move forward. Thank you. Moving forward to suspensions and expulsion data. 
So as you can see there in the overview, we had a wonderful decrease from our suspension, so suspen suspension incidences across the district. And as you can see, expulsions, it says it increased from 91 to 102. However, I'd like to point out that that is early data. So at, when, at the time when they pull this data from CalPADS, we have students in there that have a, a temporary ARIES code that's um, a, pretty much like an, a suspended expulsion. And what happens is those kids are diverted often to youth court. So once they fulfill their terms in youth court, we terminate that expulsion altogether. So we are going back in to remove those expulsion codes. We have until September to correct the data with CalPADS, and we will ensure that each student is coded correctly. So at this time, it appears that we have, for certain, 59 expulsions and nine pending right now. And we believe the, so it could be as high as 68 or as low as 59. The nine pending students, we believe, will finish their terms uh, and their work with youth court, and we're very hopeful on that, but the, the big news is that it should be much lower than 102 once we get all the data in and, and check each student individually and ensure that our data is correct. So that is a big celebration, and that speaks to a ton of our work, including youth court, um, all the work with PBIS, restorative justice at the school sites, and just a complete turnaround with a lot of schools in terms of their culture and climate. All right, so that's thank a huge you. celebration. When we get the final numbers, I would love to report that back out to you. What are we doing uh, uh, differently and new in terms of our strategies for moving forward and improving? For tier one, we, you know, we established school climate and culture teams. So last year was a big, a big difference and a big change in how we ran things. And those that include staff members, you get a ton of key, uh, staff input and support. Those teams are trained in trauma-informed practices, cultural proficiency, things like restorative practices. So that is a huge strategy that will be assisting a lot of our schools along in the process. Under tier two and tier three, one of the big things we're doing from my office is we will be launching out restorative teams. So if there is a big incident at a school site, I can launch out experts to work alongside with counselors and principals on running things like restorative conferences. So these are gonna be things that they're gonna do to help prevent us from having more green folders or expulsion cases coming through my office. So we're gonna be more preventative in my department than instead of reactionary. In addition, another a new thing that our department began is to, um, or we started doing preemptive restorative meetings with cases that are likely to come through our office as an expulsion case. So I've been finding students who have extensive records or are on their way to expulsion. We're doing preemptive meetings during those meetings with the family and the students. We're doing restorative practices. Um, we're doing a narrative approach and having them uh, come up with a plan of support for the student and then I'm giving them as many resources as I can. So we're trying to prevent students from also coming into my office on an expulsion. And the last thing, of course, is continuing to push youth court. Our, my goal this year is to really help the team in developing uh, you know, really strong models of support so that way other schools and other, um, even other cities will be interested in coming to check out our model here and pushing forward on youth court. That's been a huge resource for us. Madam President. Yes, Mr. Tillman. And, and Ms. Blackendall, I just want to say, if if you need more funding for that, then the board wants to know. I mean, that's really something that I think we want to support. I think it's going to make the difference, and I really think it's a game changer for us. So Absolutely. whatever we have to do to push it, and uh, I know um, you have a proven success record, so I'm glad you're at the helm. So whatever we need to support you, um, that's what we want to hear about. I, I certainly appreciate that, and I know coming from the, my new office, it is a huge benefit to have youth court as a resource and an alternative for our kids. I think it, it's, it's one of the most exciting parts about my job. Thank you for that support. Now we're on uh, numbers of students suspended. Again, you see a nice drop from the year prior. And again, this speaks to schools have to get really good at their tier one supports in terms of PBIS, school culture, restorative justice, and when they get good at their tier one, then the number of students that engage in activities that result in suspensions begins to decline. So this is a good indicator that our schools are getting better at climate and culture. This is the total number of days suspended, and as you can see, we have, again, another drop. 
we think that this year with me being able to, in my department, being able to train the VPs and get a little bit more consistency, we believe we can have another huge drop in that number for the following year. So we will continue to do that work. This data is just comparing us to the county and state. So I'll let you look at that comparison data. On county and state, you see that we do not have official data yet for 2017-18 because we have to pull on, on state websites. We have to wait until they report theirs to the state so that we can pull their current data. We were able to pull ours, which is at 6%. And we have noticed that um, the state and county have kind of leveled off, and we have been able to still make some gains and reduce suspension rates at our district. This is our comparison districts. We did have to pull from 1617. Again, we don't have the new data yet. It is still early. And if you look at our the first column, we do have our current rate for this 17-18 school year, which is 5.2. So it is, it is showing our 16-17 as 5.7, and then the, the slight decrease for 17-18. This, um, this is local districts. So these are the districts around us that we could find that were similar in demographics. Why don't we see? Um like Marina Valley or Rialto on here. There is okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. Moving forward. This one is suspension rates by student and race and ethnicity. We did want to point out a nice decrease in the African American suspension rates. And we absolutely believe that is work from multiple departments, especially targeted instruction, and a district-wide effort to work on our improvement in diversity and equity, cultural proficiency. Here we have by student programs. So something to note, to note is that some students are counted in diff twice, like in different programs or groups. So you could have a student that is a foster youth, but also an English learner. They would be counted twice. So those numbers do not add up to the total. Um, something else to note is that on a lot of these program group reports, our, our actual population of students has also decreased. So the, the raw numbers are lower, but the percentages may look higher. So it still is a, con you know, we don't want that concentration, the, the high concentration of our students. Um, so for example, English learners has decreased in our population almost by, I lost the number. I lost the number. We went from almost by 900 Oh, almost over 900 students. So we have 900 less English learners, if that makes any sense. Dr. Flores? Uh, these, it should be noted, these are English learners that have not been reclassified. And so when you add the reclassified by four years, it's like triple that, so, uh, or double that. So we have probably about 28,000 English learners, uh, including the reclassified. And mm -hmm. The new ESSA, the new ESSA federal program, um, says we have to count them as English learners until uh, they're done. So this does not reflect at all uh, the total of our English language learners. Okay. We do have separate RFEP numbers for the reclassified kids. We right, can but make they're sure now supposed to be together. Yeah, yeah, we can add that in. I mean, you could disaggregate them as yeah. well, but, but also make sure we add them when in. you say English language learners. They are still English language learners. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, and Dr. I mean, Mr. Tillman. Yeah, and I, I think another, another number you might want to show is, because you have Hispanic, and I'm assuming Hispanic includes the English uh, learners. I think you should have a classification, Hispanic non-English learners. 
No, just Hispanic, but... Non-English learners? I mean, right. not Spanish speaking. No, Hispanic, but Hispanics that are not classified as English learners. Mm -hmm. Because that population a lot of times is right. a lot different than the Hispanic yeah. English learner population. So then it's the it's, uh, um, English and, only. Because you see where the, if you look at the English learners suspension rate, it's much lower than the total Hispanic uh, population rate. And, um, and so if, if, you, if you saw that number, it would right. be even higher. That makes and that's sense. just something you want to look at, I think. Okay. Madam Thank President, you. I yes. have a, are we done? So I can Dr. ask Fox. a question. I Could think you? she has, oh. did she, did she finish that Almost. one presentation? Are you done? Almost there. Oh, okay. One more slide. All right. One Almost. more slide and then we can go ahead before we go into expulsions. When actually there's only one sheet for expulsion, so maybe if you can just wait for two sheets, two more sheets, and then she'll be. Okay. And, and this is just final numbers on expulsions from the for the past three years. Again, we're looking at early data, and we're hoping to be able to have that number corrected as the time time goes on, and we finish students in youth court, and that should be down to anywhere from 59 to 68. So just to be clear, you're saying the number that's for 1718 that says 102 now, yes. you think that'll be at what once the day is clear? It could, we have 59 for certain, nine pending. So it could be as high as 68 or as low in between 59 and 68. Okay. So depending on the success of the nine pend pending cases. Got it. Thank you. We didn't want to pull a different data because this is what's on CalPads. So we didn't want to be untrue to what they have right sure. now. Perfect. Thank you. That makes sense. And then now this would be the time, if the board has any questions on this section before we go into the final overview of the citation data. Dr. Flores? Yes. Um, if you all go to slide 12, um, I think that uh, our data has progressively gone down. And I would like to recognize our schools mm -hmm. who have had the uh, most uh, I mean, very salient drop in their suspensions. Uh, and I'm thinking about uh, King Middle School because I was at King for a, a, a mural event and I asked uh, Ms. Howdigy, like, what, what are highlights of your last year? You know, I, just, I wanted to know, like, what accomplishments had, had you done? And, mm -hmm. and it was significant. Uh, the year before, they suspended 300 kids, and this past year was only 15. That's significant. We need to celebrate that. And so I would recommend that we board, uh, you know, recognize our, our, our schools that are accomplishing, uh, you know, this uh, feat as well. And then on slide 13, this is a Jane, oh, she's gone, <laughs> Jane question, uh, loss of ADA. What would be the loss of ADA of 12,583 uh, kids that were suspended? I guess, are these in-house suspensions or are these off-campus suspensions? We now have to count suspensions as both OCS. Like if you're doing an on-campus suspension room, mm -hmm. you have to count those as suspensions. And you... my next question is, do we lose ADA? I believe we're... What about on-campus suspensions? under suspensions yeah we'll clarify that um i believe that we do but we i'll clarify oh Just here's jane sure. uh my question was on on slide 13. Uh, we have 12,583 suspensions so what does that amount to in terms of uh of ada that we lost and i and then my next question was if they're in-house, do we still count them as not being present, even though they're, they're in-house? I would imagine we would lose ADA on in-house suspensions because they're now just counted as suspensions. If you remove a kid from a classroom, that is a suspension. So we'll get that information to you. You'll get that email. information, yeah. okay. Yes. So okay. approximately, if it's between the first day of school and P2, which is March, April timeframe, we lose about $80 per day that a student is out. And Eighty so, dollars per day, yeah, so it would be 80 times 12,500. Yeah, approximately. Okay, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Madam President. Um, Mr. Gallo and then Mr. Tillman. Yes, thank you. Um, have we done a survey yet um, of um, the correlation between, you know, these reductions that we're seeing in suspensions and um, 
and citations and all of this and school climate and or incidences of um, you know maybe behavioral issues that we've just been throwing under the rug and avoiding or you know is there more swearing at teachers on campus is there more I, I'd just be curious if if we're seeing any corollary effects um, in school climate as it relates to these reductions you know hopefully it's it's behavioral changes yeah, so and, the question and is, and it, is, it, this, uh, so. is it actually affecting uh, the, the positive atmosphere right, exactly or is it yeah. or is it um, you know some artificial uh, yeah is it just an avoidance right, of dealing right, with right, it right, right. right. yeah, so yeah I'm, I'm just yeah. been curious about that let, so. the, let the team respond to that Lorraine or dr. Perez or Marlene if you wanted to respond to mr. mr. Gallo's comments that, that is one of the reasons why it's good to look at multiple da data points. And because if a good thing to look at is Gallup poll engagement numbers and scores. If the climate and culture is improving, then multiple data points begin to improve, as I got to see at my own school site in my experience with Curtis. It was, it was not just one thing. Like if you only saw suspensions re reduced, then there might, that might be an alarm. So you have to look at many data points. And the two schools that are represented tonight have multiple measures that are beginning to improve, in addition to just even hearing from some of their staff members how drastically different their sites are now. So yeah, and I guess it just raises the question then, absolutely. what are those combining uh, actions and uh, uh, interventions that, that might include just suspended drug court, all of these other well, drug court, the uh, uh, youth court. Youth court. <laughs> I'm Goodness, thinking Pat, Pat Morris's drug court, right? <laughs> Um, but uh, you know, between these these types of interventions and and others that we should be combining Absolutely. at local schools to see these kinds of uh, movements, yeah, it's great. Thank you. All right, Mr. Tillman. Now, someone mentioned if you leave the class, that's considered uh, being absent. What's the difference between uh, a teacher writing referral and a suspension? A teacher writes a high an office high level referral, right. which means that there has to be an intervention in the office. Sometimes that results in a suspension, often not. So in, in the same token, we were just talking about mis with Mr. Gallo, when you see suspension numbers going down, you should also see office level referrals. That's an indicator of your school culture. Are the teachers improving the way they relate to kids and the way they react to kids? That And th when they get better in the classroom, ultimately your, high level off your office high level referrals go down as well. You're, you're teaching them to use PBIS. You're teaching them how to have positive ratios with the kids. They stop sending the kids to the office so much because they're preventing the issues at the tier one level. Gotcha. So, but every, so a, a kid could leave, could leave the class with a referral and not be counted as an absent if they get sent Correct. back to the class. Yeah, office referrals are not absences. It's usually a quick process, and they're either returned to class for the next period or that period. Or if they're suspended, then that turns into, the suspension turns into an absence, yes. So what happened at your site when you had the reduction in suspensions, you also had reduction in referrals? Absolutely, yes, because we, our focus was, you know, I told the admin team, we're not going to not suspend just for our sake of our numbers to look good. Right. What we were going to do is really um, build the capacity of the teachers to be better with students so we prevent the behaviors that are coming to the office. And that's what did it, is the tier one focus is huge. That prevented, that, that, that resulted in our 70% drop in high level referrals and suspension rates. They went down at the same time. And can you clarify, what does tier one mean for the board? So tier one practices are anything that happens school-wide for all kids. PBIS is a huge program that has tier one, tier two, and tier three supports. Tier one is typically your teachers. So you want all sites to be doing, having, to have incredibly strong tier one PBIS and restorative practices in the classroom. And then tier two is when they come to the office, how do the VPs respond in terms of those kids? Tier two can be also done in the school, if, in the classroom, if needed by the teacher, but often it's also done by vice principals. And tier three is definitely done by admin, typically. And just out of curiosity, um, using your site as a test site, how long were you at Curtis? Eight years. And when did you start the whole PBIS thing? That was, I believe, a year and a half in. Into um, you know, it was it was very chaotic and very difficult. And the suspensions, if you remember, were um, at 736 suspensions in my second year. 
And midway through that year is when we began. So we started seeing a drop the following year, and then the second year we really saw a drop. Now, when you talked about this teacher training, did most of the teachers that were there when you got there, were they still there um, at the end, or did a lot of teachers leave? Uh, a number of, t a few teachers moved in the beginning. You know, you new, new leadership, it tends to, some people tend to move. But a lot of our, our teachers stuck it through with me in terms of the ones that had seen Curtis in, in its beginning stages with PBIS to where and it is now. And they bought into the training and it really oh, works. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. We can move on. Good evening. I'm uh, happy to be here on the uh, place of Joe Polino, who's in uh, Orlando as part of the Maxwell Group. He just was inducted as uh, part of the Maxwell Group. Maybe better to take that thing out, put it right up to your mouth. It's hard to hear you. Uh, I'm proud to be here representing Chief Polino, who was just inducted as part of the Maxwell Group in uh, Orlando, So, um, and presenting our wonderful work on citation, which I believe uh, on our department and district level yeah. is intentional work. Um, we've worked closely with... Uh, Special education. We've worked closely with the turn of uh, education, uh, the alternative programs, where we uh, instructed our CSOs as well as our police officers and trauma-informed principals. As a matter of fact, last Thursday, uh, we had some CPI training through special ed, how to deal with the kids, how to reduce their their tensions. So I think that's been going on for several years, which has uh, improved our citations and how our staff deals with the, the kids on campus and, and befriended the kids more than uh, seen as a, a authoritarian type. Uh, situation. Um, we're going to cover the citation arrest for a five-year summary as well as the felony and misdemeanors. Um, we're proud of the intentional work we've done. Um, in 2013-2014, uh, juvenile citations were at 1,330. Um, since then, 2017-2018, we're down to 221 for the entire year. Um, majority of those uh, are um, incidents that occur after hours, some of them. So the majority of our interaction with the police and the students on our campus are handled through a partnership with the staff, the administration, and the PBIS system, which we're very, very proud of. So a lot of the um, 221 are burglaries, a lot of trespassing where we try to ha handle these kind of things as low as possible. So these kids were found in a building where, their intent, where their, was their intent to burglarize the school or was their intent just to be there messing around? They shouldn't have been in there, yes. But we, we believe using the spirit of law versus the letter of law Handling it the lowest threshold possible by doing the trespass citations versus the burglary charge. One's a misdemeanor versus a felony. Uh, we feel that's very important. Um, we work closely with youth court. We send. Uh, we have two cadets who are interns uh, going to college full time. They work directly with youth court. They're assigned there. Uh, we had two assigned there for the entire year this year. Um, going on, going on to the next uh, slide, we tried to do uh, uh, some comparisons this year of. The citation data, we found this several years in uh, the past. Um, a lot of districts like to hide these numbers and don't give us the true numbers. So um, even with that fact, we're still lower than most districts, smaller than us. I think it's important if you look at Fontana Unified, some of their citation numbers are carried by Fontana Police Department because they have officers from Fontana Police Department on their middle schools. So these aren't, if you look at Fontana School District as a whole, this isn't their all their numbers. Um, Fontana City carries some of their citation numbers at the middle school level. Right. We're still waiting on Santa, Santa Ana, too. And another important feature, uh, if you look at these, is that our officers work 24 hours a day where a lot of these school districts end at 4 o'clock. So they rely on the city or the county, depending on where their school sits, to enforce the laws, and they carry the citation numbers on their juveniles. Um, if you go to pay, uh, slide 23, it's the breakdown of the, the 221 citations for the year um, by felony offense and misdemeanor offense. I'll give you a second to look at those. Madam President? Yes, Mr. Tillman. No, I just wanted to commend you guys for the work you've done. Uh, I know it wasn't easy to start with, and uh, uh, but again, you know, it's it's affecting and changing lives. So um, you've done it the right way. So I think everyone's better off in the end. We appreciate that. Yeah, so Madam. Chief, Chief Polino, when he came in, said, "Look, this is one of our issues. We need to start addressing." He, and he started began a change of culture in our department from the beginning when he came in that this needs to change, and it's been adopted. And it's it's really a team there, and if. 
I'll show you some flyers at the end that we passed out that nice. our, our officers are out tonight at Davidson Elementary doing national night out. Nice. Um, so it's important to know that these, these officers really care about our community. They're out there doing things on their own time, making sure they donate their time with, with these kids. Um, we have some great, great programs. And without the partnerships with, you know, uh, Lorraine's office and um, youth services and special ed, it, it wouldn't be possible for us to do these kinds of things. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Dr. Flores? I also want to thank you, but I also want to recognize COPE and ICUC for bringing it to our attention as a board and, for, and commend the board uh, for taking action and also our cabinet uh, for, it was a collective effort on all our parts in terms of you know, uh, wanting to do the best for our kids and to shift the culture. And we still have a ways to go given the suspensions that we've done, and, but the citations are down. And these are egregious, I mean, egregious citations. Uh, and you know, I don't know how we deal with those, but hopefully we will. And, um, but I think that we owe a lot to our, our community organizations as well. Thank you. And I do wanna add that uh, the school police being part of the conversation was very important too because we were able to hear their side and then get their input and of course try to collaborate on how to best move this forward. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you. I, I just and yes, want Mr. Um, Dr. Scott Wyatt. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And uh, again, thank you everyone for the wonderful presentation. Um, Assistant Chief Donahue, just to you and the chief as well as the rest of our school police folks, you know, I'm looking I love numbers, and I'm looking at the decrease in citations. And over that period, we're talking about 83.4% decrease. That's significant. I mean, it really is. And, and I know I've been monitoring this. And you know, we asked the chief to report out monthly on this. And you know, I wonder for my colleagues how many of us read that report in detail each month. It's not, think, easy. It, it's, it's not the, easy. It's not easy. I know. I'm, and I don't have my glasses on right now, and I left in my truck, so I know I'm not going to be able to see that normal report. But what I'm getting to, though, is it, it looks like we're going in the right direction with all of this. I mean, significantly going in the right direction. And do we still need that monthly report, or should we go down to quarterly? Because a lot of our reports are quarterly. Um, you know, I don't want to labor, uh, belabor our folks with work they don't need to do. I think I entrust them myself to see that this trend is going down to where I would feel comfortable with a quarterly report, not necessarily a monthly report. But, you know, that's my opinion. Also, I would like to see... I saw your positive citation, or positive ticket, excuse me, at 1,433. I'd like to see the five-year summary on that as well, or three or four-year summary. I'm not sure how long that's been around. So we Absolutely. can see how that's gone up, the reciprocal of the citations going down. It, it's gone up as we've grown our partnerships with other businesses in the community, as well as uh, with our safe routes. We're starting to work to make safe um, locations for our kids that are in trouble to be able to stop at. And they're going to be in partnership with us as far as these kids that are afraid to walk home or encounter some kind of danger that they can go to these locations, which will have a, a unique sign marked by our school district so they, these kids can go there for help. And these people have been trained on where to call, how to call us, and, and they've been vetted as far as being safe, a little background check to make sure these people are okay for our kids to go there. Okay, that, that's awesome. And really, if, if, when you talk about community policing, that is the essence of community policing, what we're doing right now. And you talked about our, our community partners and getting them involved. Uh, that's fantastic. So I'd, I'm looking forward to that presentation as well, our Safe Routes to School. Yeah. I know a number of us on this board, we've been talking right. about that for probably about up to two years now. Mm -hmm. And it, it's starting to come to fruition, mm -hmm. meaning policy and practice. So again, my compliments to everyone involved. I know we're, we have a big event coming up at Riley um, Elementary. So for those that can make it, I'm I'm sure it's going to be a grand event and just a, a, a sign of things to come for our district, not just at one school, but many schools across the city. So thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. I do want to point out it's not just mine or Chief Polino's work. It's all of, our, all of the work of our entire officers. They really believe in our community and are out there. And like, like I said, tonight's a perfect example. They're all out at one of our schools supporting Davidson, supporting the neighbors, and that, that's all in their own time. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. Well, the key for this, to Madam President and board and community, is that we're stopping the school to prison pipeline. We're not participating in it. We are actually stopping it and and investing in our kids, and 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 uh, so that our kids know we care for them, and that's what's important. Yeah. Thank you.
זה כמובן. We were on page 24, continued focus, right? Or did we, okay, we're done. Cole so I'm gonna school. introduce um, our principal from Cole Elementary, Ms. Mrs. Handy, and she's going to share a little bit about her school and immediately following, uh, Tony Woods will share uh, some things that are taking place on her campus. Good evening, Dr. Marsden, members of uh, the board and cabinet. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. I'm so excited to share with you the things that we've done this past school year. We've, got, we've done a lot of work together and I can't wait to share and talk a little bit about those three things that we did that I really can contribute to the growth. If you look at this slide here, it's, um, it, it, you could clearly see that there has been a decrease in our suspension as well as our referrals. It's over the last three years. So we, we reduced our referrals by over 50%. So last year was at 190, and this year we have just, I, I believe it's 80 82. Um, also, if you look at our ELA and our math benchmarks, like Marlene talked about, everything happens, everything is growing. As a result of our school climate, we have grown 10% in both ELA and math on our CAS this year as well. Um, so we're really, really excited about that. The Three main practices that really contributed to our growth this year is that we decided that we needed a shared vision. I used to be a teacher at Cole um, in 2003. I began teaching there. And it was the same mission, mission statement that we created together when I was a teacher. So I, I said, why don't we think about what is it that we want to see at our school? So what should it feel like? What should it sound like? What should it look like? So we got together using Zweibach training and we created a shared vision. And from that vision, we built a framework um, of coherence. The next slide. So that framework of coherence really talks about um, what we will be doing in terms of school culture. It's the PBIS. It's the one there in the middle. We also identified academic uh, objectives and goals that we wanted to make sure that we implement it. And lastly, how do we have parents engage in, in the learning that's happening at Cole? So the first thing that we did, we started just to dig into research. We started to read, we even met on Saturdays. We read John Hattie, uh, Visible Learning. We read Robin Jackson, Effective um, Instruction. We learned about learning progressions and what that looked like. We learned about how to write learning intentions and targets and, and measure that with success criteria. We talked about that. Um, and then we, and we also talked about that first instruction, that tier one, that was lacking. And then what could we do, to do about it in order to make sure that all students were learning on our campus? So looking at the RTI model, tier one means 80% of students will be learning. And we looked at that also as it related to behavior. So when we wrote our learning objective, 80% of students need to be able to master that first instruction. So I'm deliberate in terms of my, my, my planning with my partner. I'm checking um, to make sure that the students are making the necessary growth and, and meeting that target, that learning target. And then if they didn't, we, we talk about that. So we also had lesson studies. So weekly they met, looked at the scope and sequence, looked at the standards, unwrapping that, and was able to develop really strong first instruction practices. After we did that, we said, you know, we wanna see good instruction. We wanna see what PBIS is all about. So we identified some schools in our district and also outside of our district that were getting high results. So we went to, um, Curtis Middle School. So we, all of the teachers, every staff member, every certificated staff, we visited um, Curtis Middle School. And then after that, we came back and we debriefed. We talked about what are the things that we saw that were promising and things that we could commit to and add to our framework there for PBIS. And then we also visited um, schools such as Emer Emerton. They had strong systems of practice there. So we, after we met there, we came back and we talked about what commitments could we make after we saw you know, what we saw at Emerton. And then we shared all of this information in a Google Drive and then during our M uh, MOU time, we talked about what we saw and how we can make this school-wide, not just one classroom, but really coherent and clear articulation throughout as it related to practices. We also went to Hillside. Hillside was excellent in terms of rigor and relevance. And even in our studies, when we were reading um, with uh, Robin Jackson, we talked about rigor. So when we went to see the, the actual students working at a level of where we would like our students, taking them from adaptation of knowledge to, or sorry, um, acquisition of knowledge to adaptation of knowledge, what does that learning progression really looks like? So we came back and we also, again, made commitments 
and talked about what we would do to change our old practices. Um, the biggest learning that we got from our visits is we realized, and not even just from our visits, but from our planning and talking and just collaborating um, as a whole, we decided that it wasn't the kids that needed to change, it was us. And so once we got that we needed to change, everything changed from that point on. The, the, the teachers realized that the, they were doing the work and the kids weren't doing the work. So we had to just be patient and allow learning to happen. And so that's what happened and that's why we got a lot of the success. What we're moving forward um, right now is, and we started it last year, is we're building leader efficacy. We want our students to know that they can be leaders. We visited Rialto, a school in Rialto, I believe it's Donalu, and we also visited a school in Romaland, Roman, Romaland Elementary. They're lighthouse schools. So they do leader and me there. So we um, learned about that last year, and this year we're implementing leader and me in small phases. So we do have leadership clubs that we are establishing. For example, Odyssey of the Mind, Penguin Ambassadors, Tech Club, just to name a few. And there's a certain criteria that students have to meet in order to get into the, cl um, the club and also a certain criteria that they have to meet in order to stay in the club. And so we're building my, a mindset of excellence and understanding what those seven principles of what an effective leader is, the tenets of the seven habits of highly effective people. So they're learning how to be proactive. They're learning the win-win. Um, and the reason why uh, we want to focus on developing teacher uh, or leader advocacy is to empower them and to also challenge the students to understand that they can create change on their campus. And we, we also know that they have permission and the power to, to make that change. So in closing, uh, one of the things that we believe at Cole is that um, we believe that students are successful as a result of our collective uh, actions toward meeting whatever the goals that we create together. So it's that con togetherness, that collective teacher advocacy, that's something that we're all about. And because of that, We've, saw, we've seen behavior drastically de decrease, um, improve, and we've also seen our test scores go up. All right, thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Good evening, Madam President, Vice President Rogers, um, board and superintendent and cabinet. Um, I'm Tony Woods, and I am the proud principal at um, Del Vallejo Middle School. I'm very blessed to be there. I'm going to um, just hit a couple points of our data, which I feel um, has been very successful for us and our school and our culture um, with our students, as well as our families and our staff. Um, one of the things that I want to point out on our data is our decrease in suspensions. Um, as we were speaking earlier about, um, I believe it was uh, Mr. Tillman that talked about um, the suspensions can decrease, but what are we doing? What are the proactive things that we're doing and what are the interventions that we're putting in place? Because suspensions can just be numbers. And, but if you don't have something in place, then you know you never know where it's gonna go the following year. So the one of the things that we did have a really big drop um, in suspensions. Um, I tried to do my calculation at home. I hope I did it correctly. I, I calculated 46%. I had my husband help me a little bit with that. So um, we went down 46% in suspensions. And so I always believe if you're going down, that interventions and proactiveness should be going up. So a few of the things that we have been doing um, with that is, um, our team, um, our vice principals collectively brought our teachers together and we created, we took the top three um, offenses with referrals that could potentially go into suspensions and we created other means of corrections. What are we gonna do with our students in lieu of suspension? And what can we do to proactively when we see this happening with our students, such as cursing at the teacher, what can we do to correct them immediately with the teacher? What can interventions can we put in place? What conversations can we have with the students? And um, so those were put into place. We had our top three, and we worked on that collectively as a group. So the teachers were involved. So they weren't just getting this um, protocol of what they're going to do. They actually wrote the protocol, and so which was really good. Um, we also had um, interventions put into place. We had our um, staff acting as mentors. Um, from our counselors to our custodians. They work with our students. They mentor our students, mentor our students. We have um, 
some of our um, staff, our classified staff as well, certificated staff, working with our students within the sports programs, working with our students at lunchtime, giving up their time at the beginning of the school day, at the end of the school day, to work with the students and to really make those connections with them. We had a um, great success last year with home visits. I have some wonderful staff that are willing to go to the home and do those home visits to just speak to the parents because they're not coming to the school site, but to speak to the parents in regards to what can we do to help support you, to help support your student at the school site. Um, we've also had, um, within our team meetings, um, our teachers have common prep periods where they share their students, and then when we have our team meetings, really going in and working with the teams to have those effective meetings and discuss, discussing students, goal setting um, with the students, putting in those interventions, and um, really being very specific as to what behaviors we're working on. and. Um, and also rewarding our students. We piloted last year a program called PBIS Rewards, which is a um, scanning point system for students. We, pro we piloted it with our sixth grade teachers and our seventh grade teachers, and it was um, wonderful. Our, te our students got incentives throughout the year. At the end of the year, our top 50 point earners um, earned a trip to Fiesta Village, which was graciously sponsored by one of our teacher's uncles. And um, he paid for their admission, we paid for the bus, and our students had a, a fantastic time. So they had something positive to work for, towards, and then they also had interventions put in place for that. Um, also with our attendance, um, we saw a 1% increase. I really do contribute that to our home visits as well. If we hadn't seen a kid, I mean, two days we were calling, we were going to the home, we were making sure that they were okay. Our counselors were really great with that. And also um, our teachers and just working, and I, I stand at the front gate and I greet the students as they come in. And then if they weren't here the day before, I ask them where they were. And they're like, well, I wasn't here. I'm like, I know you weren't here. That's why I'm asking you, where were you? And just having that connection with our students. And so it's really, um, I think sometimes our students, especially in middle school, I call us the middle child because we, you know, we're not the youngest ones, we're not the oldest ones. And sometimes they feel left out. And where they are mindset wise, they just, they're just trying to fit and if somebody just notices something one little thing about them then they're going to say okay i do matter and so those are a couple things that we did in regards to the um suspension decrease and the attendance um increase and then that then will then filter into our scores um, we made a slight um, increase with our language arts the three percent we stayed the same with math um, as we dig deeper into the data we're going to see that we made a huge growth I'm getting the students towards that meeting the standards. And so we're very, we're very excited about that. Um, three of the promising practices that we are very excited for and that we have been um, working on towards the end of last year and then into this year um, is our collaborative professional learning foci. Our, we are working on our, um, our, our instructional focus is collaborative structures, really getting the students to communicate with each other, having those um, very focused, direct, structured conversations that are about the standards and objectives and learning and really having those structures built into the classroom. That was one of the things that, as I took the teachers on instructional rounds, our very first instructional round, we saw that there was some really good learning, but the students weren't talking and they weren't communicating. And so really putting in those structures so that they have that, um, those um, really great conversations, academic conversations. And then our second focus is the student-teacher relationships, really working on that and building those relationships amongst the adults and the peers. And the reason why I say that this is so exciting for us is because the process we, we took um, to get to this point. It was very collaborative. The teachers worked together. We read research. We um, discussed what we wanted to see. We discussed what our outcome wanted to be as a collective group. So together, we um, brought this focus and we're bringing it to life. And as we work together, we're, we're really working at, on that collective efficacy with our, with our staff because it really, as we've had these discussions, it really starts with a strong core and the strong core is our staff. Mm -hmm. And then it filters out to our students. Um, the next um, one I wanna talk about, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go in a different order because the one I really want to talk about is exciting for me. So I'm going to talk about the sixth grade exploratory strand. So we, um, I went in and we didn't really have a clear pathway of what we were going to do with our students. As we sat and talked as a team, um, we talked about that middle school 
should be more of an exploration. What are we going to do with our kids? How many th different things can we um, engage them in and give them some um, just some exposure to. So we have a sixth grade strand because we figure that our sixth graders are coming in. They're still kind of lost. They haven't found their place yet. They're still young. They don't know if they should be in elementary or middle school. So we started this strand because we felt it was going to be very effective for them. So, th so during this year, a group of our sixth graders are going to um, rotate through four different electives. They're going to have um, nine weeks of STEM, nine weeks of Cadet Corps, nine weeks of AVID, and um, nine weeks of STEM Cadet Corps AVID. No, it's not music. STEM Cadet Corps AVID. I'll think about it. It'll come to me. So they're going through those four four different strands, and they're going to have that exposure to all of them so that when they get to seventh grade, they're going to say, yes, I want to go into STEM, and I want to spend a, a year in STEM, or I want to go into cadet, and I want to be a cadet leader, um, or I want to go into um, really engross and avid and have those tutorials and really go to that college career readiness. Digital, um, digital uh, broadcasting is, this, is the fourth one. And so they'll rotate through that. And so we're very excited to have that exploration for our students, which will raise engagement for our students. Our very, the very last thing I want to talk about is um, what we're starting this year. We are having an advisory class. It's our first period home, homeroom class. And it's a full period. It's a 47-minute period block. And we, um, the focus there is developing leadership and character building within all of our students and integrating the SEL components and our PBIS um, success skills within that advisory period and really building our students. We have so many students that have such strong leadership um, leadership abilities and just leadership um, qualities about them, but they're not focusing those in the right direction. And so our goal is to use a program called Mindset Matters, and it has six different modules to it. One of them is courage. Um, it goes into collaboration, communication, leadership, and really developing our students that way. They have a home to go to the very first period. So we see that that's also going to um, increase attendance because they're going to be excited to go to this period, and they're going to make connections with their teachers and really have um, that opportunity to develop the whole child. And I think that's what's really important with our students at Del Vallejo because some of them are coming from um, such um, trauma-filled um, environments that if they come somewhere and they're there safe for that first period, it's really going to make a huge impact with our students and their well-being. So I'm very excited as we um, as we go into this coming year. Our teachers are excited. Our students are excited that they're going to homeroom first period because they have been used to rotating. And um, I just want to say thank you to all of um, all of you on the board and on the cabinet who have supported myself, my staff at Del Vallejo because we are there for our students. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Woods, you just finished your first year there. Is that correct? Last year or almost uh, a full year? Almost a full year. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Almost a full that's year. So too. yeah, okay. yeah. All right, Dr. Flores. Okay. So I just wanted to thank you guys for your time and bring it full circle. So you heard them share a lot about the culture and the climate on their campus and talk a little bit about the attendance and suspension, but really calling out the fact that this is how we get the change that we're looking for. They've got to invest in building their culture. And so you were able to hear some of the evidence of that as well as matching that with the results that they were getting. So thank you guys for your time this evening. Yes, Dr. Flores. And then Dr. Hill afterwards. Thank you for uh, the presentation. It's, it's hopeful, and that's what we are, making hope happen, correct? And it's for our kids. And Dr. Marsden, I really like um, this, what I call a mediated structure, this matrix mm -hmm. that you have. I think we should have this for every middle school and high school. Um, as a board, I would like to see you know, comparative data of our middle schools and our high schools uh, so that we can see that. And I like that we have the trends, that we can see the trends and they can also see the trends. Mm -hmm. and, know, and what Mr. Tillman said about, it's just not the data, but it's what e each school side is implementing in terms of changing the culture. And that's what we have to capture. Uh, 
you know, because I know that at each school, I mean, you both mentioned, and I'm sure at all our schools, that's what's going on, but we are not aware of it. And so I, I would really appreciate, you know, like a narrative or uh, aspects about how, you know, they're engaging in. Sure. And, and we, can, we can look in how right. to do that. But I to. think this is a really good, mm -hmm. I'm Thank a Vygotskian, and I'm very visual. And so this, I call it a mediated structure, a, a matrix. This matrix is very powerful. And you can see all the parts in the hall at once. And then you can focus in on the different detail. And it really, uh, you know, uh, shows the growth. And that's what we need to do. Because our, I mean, you do this every day. It's, it's difficult work. And you have to really, um, you know, um, when you get depressed, you go back and say, OK, <laughs> here's the data. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. So I, I think that would be you. great. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks. Okay, there's, um, before we go to Dr. Hill, um, there's two options. We could either pause a moment and have public comments, or we could finish before, which is like about six more minutes of all the comments. That way we can start um, public comments at 8 o'clock. We have Dr. F we have, um, Dr. Hill, uh, Mr. Tillman, and who else? Okay, so if we can. Let's just go, yeah. Okay. As long as Dr. Hill keeps hers at 20 seconds, we'd be good. Okay. <laughs> I can't keep mine at 20 seconds. I, I have my notes. But I only have nine things just to, uh, some just information, uh, some are questions. One, I know you talked about uh, working with Loma Linda, but I just want to share with you that Dignity Health is also uh, going to work with our schools. So just want you to know that's. Uh, a resource for you. And then my second one, uh, uh, Be Still, is that at all grade levels or just elementary school? You know, the program that if a student moves, they can still stay at the same school? And, and you don't have to answer that now, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just concerned about that. that you Because know, I think that makes, it makes a difference if they can stay at the same school, if they move in a place yeah, we, in the we city. We believe it's at all schools. At all schools. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, and what time of day is attendance taken? I know it used to be second period at secondary. Does it have to be second period? For secondary, it's within the first 10 minutes of each period. Which one is reported for to show that a student is in attendance? I, I believe all of them, all of them. And then I believe that it, um, because uh, the questions I've asked is which one counts, like if they're absent for first and second period, or they counted absent for the day, or what, but they have to be absent for all periods in order for it to then, um, I believe, but maybe. What's the policy? So as law. <clears throat> we collect ADA mm -hmm. if a student's there even a short amount of time. Right. There's other policies that may relate to how many periods, but as far as ADA goes, yeah. um, even if they're there one period. Even if they show up one period, it's considered. It's considered. ADA, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, great. Okay, and, and I know on page 17, uh, mm -hmm. the African American suspension rate much higher. I'm hoping you can provide for us. Is, is that higher at one school over another? If we could just kind of see see um, where, where, which schools with the highest suspensions. And if you could bring that back to us, as well as the ethnicity of the school, where the highest suspensions are, I'd appreciate that. Yes. So okay. we, we are actually um, digging into that data, looking at things a lot more specifically, and we'll be happy to bring that information back to you. OK, thank you. And then the one thing I want to share, uh, one day at San Andreas, I was standing out front when a uh, kid came on campus, and it was, I think, a middle school kid. And Chief Underwood knew him. And he said to the young man, he said, how are you doing? And the young man used a four-letter word to respond. And Chief Underwood didn't do anything, so I'm looking at him. And when the kid left, I said, did you hear what that kid just said to you? He said, yes. He said, last week I had to arrest his mother. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes we need to take a look at causes. And for that reason, you know, Chief Underwood said, I probably would have said it to the same person who, who had arrested my mom. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we need to, need to take a look at circumstances. And I hope our administrators and teachers will do that. 
I was concerned because I got a call the weekend um, from a friend who said that one of our teachers told a young man, don't, uh, if you go in and teach, don't come to San Bernardino because we don't do anything about discipline. In fact, he said on his campus, there were five weapons mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't do anything about it. He said they suspended one kid, but the other four who had weapons. So of course, I've learned to not take things <laughs> that face value that are here. So of course, I asked which schools and they said, well, I think it's up near your house. So I looked at all the elementary schools, instead of including yours, Miss Andy, to uh, find this man's name, and I didn't find him any place. So I just hope uh, to our listening audience, when people share those types of things with you, ask other questions like what school and where, and, and things of that nature. So uh, I'm just concerned that people are giving false information to people who will take it at face value. Uh, appreciate the positive tickets. I, I think it's a great thing. Uh, the home visits, I tell you, if you really want to know what's going on, and I'm so glad you're doing that, Ms. Woods. And, uh, and then, Ms. Handy, thank you for sharing about visiting other schools, because we don't have to go into Orange County in LA. We have it right here in this district. We just have to understand that if it's there, let's go see it so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say a great presentation. Thanks for all the information. And with your enthusiasm, and I'm a face watcher and everything, but with your enthusiasm, I know we're going to have a great year. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Mr. Tillman. I know um, someone said um, we assume that we're doing this at all the middle schools, but I don't want to assume. So um, I, gu I guess I'd like to see the, the data. I mean, if we have sites that are flatlined on the suspension rate of five years ago and it hasn't changed, mm -hmm. then I think um, we're at a point now where we're not asking is there a solution. We know what the solution is. Right. So therefore, um, I don't know if you can do this in a non-voluntary way, but I really think it's a disservice to students at sites that aren't seeing this success if we know that we have a canned package now and we know what it takes to, to make the change. So I guess to the superintendent, what I'm saying is, at some point you should present to us where the rest of the middle schools are at, and if they're not moving in this direction either, I mean, the. The leadership has to accept they're going to, you know, contact um, one of the experts that we have in front of us, or they might decide they want to make the change, but we need to put somebody new in there. No, and you, yeah, and Mr. Tillman, you're, you're highlighting exactly what cabinet does on a day-to-day -day basis. We do the deeper dive by schools. Uh, we dig in. If the school isn't moving, uh, then we we work with leadership, uh, and it it all starts as you heard. It starts and ends with leadership. So I understand that. So, yeah, so, so my point is if, if we have sites mm -hmm. and we don't see the movement, right. then we need the board needs to know that. Uh, We'd we, be happy to share that information. That's what I want to see. Thank you very much, and All thank right, you thank for you. a great presentation. Thank, thank you for the presentation, and we're going to go ahead and move forward for the public comments. Thank you. Great job. So the board welcomes our first public comment speaker, and thank you all for your patience tonight. Mr. Trayvon Martin, welcome back. As Mr. Trayvon Martin is coming up, I just want to mention that the Board of Education is prepared to receive comments from members and the public on any matter which is uh, within its uh, subject matter jurisdiction. Uh, when recognized, please step forward, give your name, and limit your comments to five minutes or less. Go ahead. Good evening, President Medina, Vice President Rogers, esteemed board members, Dr. Marzen and Cabinet. My name is Trayvon Martin. I'm the Public Affairs and Community Engagement Representative for California School Boards Association. I'm here this month with your update from CSBA. Uh, first, I would like to take a personal um, a thank you to you all for your funding and your support of the mural at King uh, that the 30 under 30 did. Uh, I wasn't there for the opening speech, but I did make it down there later on to help paint some of the murals. And to see some of the King uh, students out there helping paint the mural as well was just fantastic. So hopefully they're enjoying that. Um, first thing in CSBA world, 
CSBA would like to thank those who attended the Leadership Con uh, Institute. We hope that you received valuable information from it. Uh, and then I did speak with uh, Vice President Rogers about getting some of the information from the coding uh, program. So I do have the CEO of Black, Girl, Black Girls Code and uh, Latinos Girl Code that wants to have a 30 minute conversation. So whenever you're available, please let me know and I will schedule that with them. Um, number two, the annual education conference will be held November 29th through December 1st. I hope you were able to take advantage of the early registration rates, which ended on August 3rd. Um, and this year, it's being held in San Francisco as well. Number three, the State Allocation Board. The State Allocation Board proposed an amendment, and if it's accepted, the State Allocation Board will cease accepting applications for new construction and modernization project funding when the bonds have been, when the board has received enough funding requests to the amount of the available bond authority. This would change what means to be no more list and would create number one, wouldn't show the need for more f state facilities funding. Number two, secure a local uh, educational agency's place in line when the funds are available. So um, on um, July 11th, the state allocation board held a stakeholders meeting in Sacramento. They are planning to hold a stakeholders meeting in Southern California. So definitely we'll keep you um, uh, updated on that. We want as many people to attend. We wanna keep the list in place. We don't think it's fair that a, agent, uh, a district gets kicked out of line when the uh, state allocation board has more money. Uh, the next um, uh, update is to uh, Assembly Bill AB2 76 Medina's Charter School Transparency Bill. The Charter School Transparency Bill did pass the Education Committee and should be taking further action this week. So I'll bring you update on that at the next board meeting. SB 328 Portatino's Pupil Attendance Late Start Bill. As you know, um, it did not pass uh, the Senate when it first was introduced. Uh, actually, this morning, the Senate made a motion to reconsider the bill. CSBA's uh, legislative advocates uh, don't believe it has enough uh, votes to pass uh, at this time. Uh, as you know, CSBA does not support the bill. It's not because we don't think late start is a good idea. We see that we have locally elected officials who can make that decision right here at the dais, and we don't need the state to make that decision for all the school districts. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to track that bill. It should have some further uh, action as well this week as it's in appropriate, uh, should be heading to appropriations for a vote. Um, also CSBA's uh, legislator awards, the deadline for nominating the 2018 Legislative Advocate Award for your, leg your local legislator has been extended to Thursday, September 6th. So what that would mean would would mean as a board, you would nominate somebody. Uh, you have to have a board resolution. So I would recommend to the board to uh, agendize it for the next board meeting if you're planning on nominating someone. Um, and then you would need to uh, make a motion uh, and then talk about and discuss the person. And then once it passes, submit that to CSBA. And then we will uh, have your nomination form. Lastly, I know a few meetings ago, Dr. Hill asked about having the agendas put on iPads and things of that nature. So wanted to offer, CSBA offers an agenda online program um, and it's specifically tailor-made for K-12 boards. So I have some information on that. Um, they changed the way that uh, they charge the school districts for it. It used to be charged based on ADA. Now it's just a flat rate for all school districts. So I do have a fact sheet on that for the board to consider. And if you need any information um, after you read the fact sheet, just please send me an email or give CSBA a call and we'll be happy to, uh, to talk about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and by the way, I am using my computer to use um, the agenda. So something that we can definitely try using. Thank you, Mr. Martin, for your comments. Thank you. Board welcomes uh, Mr. Ryan Berryman. Good evening, sir. And your topic is dad take their child to school day, September 28th. Yes. Thank you. And you, you can go ahead and pull that out of the stand and hold it up. It's, it'll, that way we can hear you. Uh, yes, you that's correct. 
also have some copies. I was wondering if oh, I. Oh, great! Can get yeah, some. you can you can pass them uh, to Dr. Volkmar here. He's our deputy superintendent. He'll he'll share those with the board. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, dear Superintendent Del Marson and distinguished board members and cabinet, my name is Ryan Berryman. I'm co founder of San Bernardino Fatherhood. Um, my background, if you don't know, is I have worked with San Bernardino County for over 20 years as a social worker working in children and family services. And working in that population, working in that environment, in that culture, I recognize there was not a lot of services for fathers. Hmm. And safe mothers or safe families, a lot of time it seems to be that you're typically looking at moms and children, maybe dads. And I recognize that, so therefore I started a, a fatherhood program. Uh, since I retired in 2016, since the program's been open, I've been volunteering my time at Emerton School. This is my third year volunteering at Emerton School. When I first started there, I asked, I said, uh, do you have any students that I can just come in and read to? So working under um, uh, Karen Dunn, a community relations person, she gave me a list of students to read to. So I, I meet with these students on Tuesdays and Thursdays for about three hours, and, I, and I'll read to them, individually, sometimes in small groups. And I find out a lot of times they have difficulty reading. And I try to make it fun and rewarding to them. As part of the fatherhood program, what I like to do is read um, an invite to you. I ask, please join San Bernardino Fatherhood, Emerton Elementary School, Fathers Incorporated, and other schools across the nation for the Million Father March on, Feb on Friday, September 28th. The Million Father March is an opportunity for dads, uncles, grandfathers, coaches, mentors, faith-based community men's of groups, organizations to show their commitment to the educational lives of their children throughout the school year by escorting their child to school on this day. The schools are encouraged to engage in activities that support the theme, Real Dads Read. Reading is a fundamental skill. A child's ability to read proficiently by third grade is the most significant pre predictor of his and her school success, high school completion, and future economic stability. Real Dads Read attempts to change the outcomes by engaging families, communities, schools, to encourage fathers to read to their children. Reading is also a beneficial way for fathers to spend quality time with their children. By design, the Million Father March is a community-driven event and is not restricted to fathers only. Grandfathers, foster fathers, stepfathers, uncles, cousins, big brothers, significant male caregivers, families, family friends, and other male role models are all encouraged to participate. Additionally, representatives from such entities such as public and private schools, community-based organizations, government agencies, <laughs> local businesses, faith-based institutions, along with elected officials are also asked to join and support the march Last year, San Bernardino Fatherhood and Emerton School participated in this event on October the 27th. For every father and male caregiver who escorted their child to school, each child was given a free children's book. Last year, we had over 28 dads and male caregivers escort their child to school. And over 68 st students received a free children's book for their dad to read to them. This year, we're expecting to at least double that participation from last year. Along with this, we have a number of different other events, and we're just asking if the board would, and, and the superintendent would uh, support San Bernardino Fatherhood, Emerton School, and other schools participating in this similar event um, by providing the information to the school district. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Berryman, and uh, it would certainly be our pleasure and want to uh, to do that and, and also want to compliment your leadership at Emerton and thank you for your your service It's a great example for our community to have leaders like you to do that. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much uh, Board now welcomes a Majadi uh, topic of the Boys and Girls Club. Welcome, sir and Good evening. And thank you for your patience.
Good evening, Madam President, uh, Board, Superintendent. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm going to come and provide a quick update on a couple of things. Um, one is I want to uh, let you know that. Yeah, put it on. Put it closer we to We can you. hear you. We just need, it just needs to be right close to your mouth is all. Right here? Yeah, yeah there you go. Okay, Perfect. here we go. Okay. So thank you again for another year of partnership with our summer day camp program. We um, had 268 children enrolled in our program. We hired 36 adults to work for us for the summertime and 20 students. Uh, 18 of them were all San Bernardino Unified School District students that worked for us. Um, we also had 60 plus young people involved or enrolled in our algebra program. So again, none of this is made possible without the support of this board and for the third year in a row, We've exceeded expectations, and knock on wood, uh, no children were injured, no serious injuries, no uh, issues at all for like 10 years going now. And so we're very grateful for the relationship and the partnership and keeping kids safe during the summertime. The next thing I want to report out on very quickly is <clears throat> our DTP program. Now, I haven't talked to you about DTP in quite a while, but I'm kind of excited to share with you that since we started the DTP program at, at Royal Valley uh, High School, 100% of our seniors have graduated. 100% of our seniors are enrolled in college. T-Mobile has come aboard as a sponsor for our DTP program. And uh, this coming uh, uh, week, next week, Friday, we'll be actually driving one of our DTP graduates up to Cal State East Bay uh, to send him off um, with all the love and support. And so uh, I'm grateful to have the access to the students at Oroyo Valley. Um, uh, uh, the principal and the staff has always been welcoming. Uh, the council has always been very supportive in responding to the needs of the students and inquiries made by me or the parents. Dress the part. Dress the part. The idea, of course, is to furnish the young people after they've demonstrated their commitment to the program. We buy them brand new suits, shirts, ties, belts, shoes, etc., and they wear them to school every other Thursday. And then when they, when they don't wear the suit, they wear the polo shirt that says DTP. And they wear the suits in public when they go out to board meetings or council meetings or uh, usher uh, events at different community-based organizations where they get requested often. Um, and again, T-Mobile has been a tremendous sponsor and supporter of the program as well. Uh, this summer, they came aboard and they brought shoes for all of the high school students at the Boys and Girls Club. They held all types of events for our kids in the DTP program. It's been very beneficial to have that partnership. I also want to share with you that <clears throat> And forgive me, I've got a little bit of uh, stuff going on here. So our third year with the, with the summer swimming program at San Bernardino High School, the third year. And for the third year, no major injuries. I say no major injuries because you're going to get your scrapes and stuff like that, but no one has been injured, seriously, and there's been zero drownings. And I know that Mr. Haynes, if he's still here, is probably real glad to hear that because the very first year, as you all recall, it was a lot of concern about opening the pool up to the public, and safety was the number one concern. And so you'll be happy to know that we, uh, for third year in a row, have had no drownings and no major injuries. Uh, we also hired 16 lifeguards. And this year, what's different about the program is that the lifeguards we hired, 14 of them were all students in San Bernardino Unified School District. They're either part of the polo team, uh, swim team, or something of, na of that nature. We actually paid, got them trained, and certified uh, as lifeguards, as well as uh, certified with CPR and first aid. And they did a fantastic job for us. So. Um, Again, very happy about that. Uh, let me uh, also share with you that um, there are some changes that we are undergoing at the Boys and Girls Club, and I rightfully shouldn't even be able to say Boys and Girls Club right now because our charter had been revoked by the national organization. I want to be very clear in terms of why and what we're doing in an effort to reestablish that relationship. We received notification on May 25th that our background check policy seemed to be out of compliance with the national organization. Uh, we took exception to this, and we still take exception to it, and we are challenging it. When I took over 10 years ago, LexisNexis was the system in which we used, and it did local database stuff, data in, data out. Um, we elected to go with a live scan pro process that we thought was more comprehensive. The national organization's contention is that we should be doing background checks every year. Our position is that our, our background policy that we have now is, is better and it exceeds national expectations. With the national organization, um, you get hired on April, on April 25th, you get background, you don't get background again until next April. With our policy, if I hire you on April 25th, if March 12th you get arrested, March 13th we get notified. 
if we didn't have our policy in place, we'd have to wait until next year to find out about that particular arrest on that particular employee. Which is why we made our argument to the national organization that our policy exceeds expectations. And there are two recent incidents that I won't go into detail on, uh, one of them quite serious. But if we only utilize national's policy, these individuals would be working with kids now, given that the CAPS program has begun, the school year has begun, as opposed to them being terminated because we got notification the very next day of their arrest and what the charges were. So I need you all to understand that since uh, we began working as a vendor and a partner with the school district. Since I have been the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club since 2008, we have never had anyone work for us, volunteer for us, who had not been fully background, live scanned. Our kids have never been in danger. I'll take any questions if you have any. If not, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Mr. Majotti. Thank you. Let's talk to um, Dr. Flores. I just want to say that I graduated from Cal State Hayward which is now called East Bay, which I don't like. <laughs> but I got my BA at Cal State Hayward. And, I, and I'll tell you, it's a great school. It's up on a hill. You can see the Bay Area. It's small. Well, it was small when I was there, but I don't know what the student body is. But I think the, the, the young man, is it a young man? It is. Yeah, he's going to love it. It's so beautiful. He's yeah. very excited about it. Yeah. This was not even on his radar uh -huh. three years ago. And right. so again, having that access to be able to go to the right. school anytime right. and the counselor support, right. it made the difference. Yeah, it was, it's a great school. Going. I got my BA, everyone, in 1970. <laughs> That's a long time ago, yeah. All right, thank you so much, and thank you for bringing that. All right, thank you. I go send our public oh, I'm sorry, I have, Mr. I have a Mr. question, Mr. Um, was the uh, revocation by the National Association or whatever the national organization, yes. was it solely based on the, um, the procedures for um, live scan? And absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So the letter we received stated the charge that seems to have gone awful far down the road for something that you would think might have been. No doubt. No doubt. Uh, like well, any other organization that. Um, has to rebuild, which we had to do from 2008 to current, had to restructure, rebuild, new board members in and out, et cetera. You go through growing pains, you have issues, but National is there to help you walk through it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's easy, but we've had our issues over the years, but they've all been rectified and taken care of. The notification we received said, very specifically, charter revocation due to you being in violation of our background policy, which includes mm -hmm. the barrier policy. Wow. Absolutely. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. And those are all the public comments tonight, board. Okay. We're going to go ahead and uh, it's currently 8.20, so we're going to try to move forward. 7.0 reports by uh, reports and comments. 7.1 report and report by San Bernardino Teachers Association. Ms. Uh, Beza-Kala mentioned that they have no report tonight. Okay. Um, 7.2 report by California School Employees Association. Uh, looks like also no report. Okay. Great. Uh, 7.3, report by Communication Workers of America. Um, also, no report. Okay. 7.4, report by San Bernardino School Police Officers Association. I see also no report. Okay, then we're going to go ahead at 7.5, comments by board members. Okay, then we're going to start with, on the side of for Mr. from Mr. Tillman all the way to Dr. Scott White. I want to start by thanking... Um, um, Superintendent and uh, Ms. Kostakis and staff for the work they've done on the uh, solar projects. I drove past Cesar Chavez and you know, I just said to myself, this is like a win-win. You, you decrease the cost for electricity and you gain covered parking. How could you lose with that? So I, I talked to Ms. Kostakis and we are going to look at doing other projects at the sites. You know, I think we should maybe have a goal of being you know, 100% clean energy by a certain year based on what we really think is doable. Or maybe this, maybe we can do incremental 25%, 50%, because we're blessed to live in an area where we have so much sunlight and we really should capitalize on it. And I think the technology is there. So um, I think um, it's important that the, ball, that, the, that the board makes it a priority and then um, mm -hmm forced ourselves to set realistic goals 
And then I think we'll all benefit from it because this is a huge benefit just because we pushed so hard to get it. So thank you for that. And if that could be added as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to set that 100% goal. That would be great. Thank you. And then um, I have my uh, Black Future Leaders Program coming up. So it's actually orientation is September the 2nd. The program is September 7th through uh, September the 9th. And I don't know who the right person in the district is, but it really benefits us if we can contact the counselors at the high schools is for students to have a 3.0 GPA or better going from middle school to high school. And they're getting the program. They stay at Cal State San Bernardino on Friday night, Saturday night, and they go home on Sunday. Um, this year, part of the um, project with the essay will be writing an essay about um, the Black Panther movie. And then we're going to have a field trip to the Museum of Los Angeles where they have the King Tut exhibit. So it'll be a rich program as usual. Um, we usually we cap it at 50. But the great thing about the district when they partner with us and identify the students with those GPAs, you just have some brilliant kids that may be living in just um, um, challenged situations, but they have so much potential. And so uh, I just I don't know who the person I don't know who the right person is to reach out to you. Okay, and. Um, I know that usually this week is a busy week for them, but maybe next week they can get us a list and we have the application. Uh, we did make the announcement at the, the award ceremony for the 3.0 um, students, so um, they know about it. So uh, if you can get the information to me, it'd be great. Right. And then we'll, we will submit a proposal to the district uh, for the students that go to uh, our district, so I'll get that to you also. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Mr. Gallo? Yes, thank you. Uh, Danny, did I get this straight? You wanted Dale to set a 100% goal um, on his... First. He's never wanted 100% of anything. I'm not this is kidding. Po- I'm this is possible. Him. I'm just teasing. Yeah, as long I as know. it's possible, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. You just told me we could have one solar flare. I think flare. Should. I, I just... think it's great. Yeah, this is a, yeah, you wipe out all of them, right? Right. And um, all I want to say is just uh, welcome back, uh, ready for a new school year. Um, I see some excitement on the faces of everybody back there. Uh, <laughs> would somebody please wake the rest of them up? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know everybody's, uh, hopefully you've had uh, a good start to the week. Um, um, you know, we're, we're pretty um, positive uh, people that are sitting up here. You know, we, um, uh, we have high aspirations and and high expectations, and uh, for our for our students as you do, and we just like to celebrate with you um, and welcome you back with our new start. If you need anything, uh, you know I know there's growing pains and starting off the school year. There always is, and uh, we're here to support and help and have a great year and look forward to our student success. Thanks. Great, thank you, Mr. Gallo, uh, Doctor. I mean. Miss Rogers, keep saying it until it That's happens. Doctor says, yes, eventually it will. It will. I trust you. The power of the words, definitely. <laughs> um, just a couple of things, and I and just to, to add to what you said, Mike. Definitely welcome back to everybody. The district has done a great job um, putting out a whole lot of social media, and we captured a lot of that and put it on our pages as well. Remind students to be in school. You know the importance of that, and when school started. So I'm really excited about that because you know people. Am I stealing your? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So let me just go on my list because Dr. Wyatt is just fired up over there. Um, I know that, and I'll just say this quickly because I know that Dr. Flores is going to talk a little bit more on this, but I just happened to be at an event a couple of weeks ago, and it was mentioned again about Footsteps to Brilliance, and I guess the process, and I don't, I'm not sure exactly what it is or how the campuses need to have access, but just chiming again off of the young lady who came the previous week and spoke so much about the library, and I love libraries. My kids were there every summer and all the time getting their in and out burger certificates, but we did, you know, invest a lot into that. So everyone needs to understand it. It's right at the tips of the hands of our parents and those that qualify. We just need to let them know. But that was a complaint that came to me, and I told them that I would share that um, with the with the district. Also, I would like the district to also look into as we are continuing to build on our counselors and on the presentation. And I know we're going to be getting more updates, but. I did um, talk to a parent, happened to uh, speak with a parent about her student being in two pathways. Now, maybe there's a reason why that would happen, but when I just asked a little bit more questions, I realized that they were not in their college core classes, but they had two pathways. 
So we need to check into that because, of course, we know that we take them off the track of college, which you know I believe in having options. So please look at that, and when we get the presentation, maybe we can build upon. After you explore that, maybe you know some of our counselors need a little bit more awareness of what we're trying to do with the pathways. Pathways are great, but you know we want to make sure that they have the other option as well, the main option. Also, um, I was going to mention this in the last presentation, but wasn't sure where it fit, and I really wanted them to to finish. But it also came to my attention that I, I guess we have a policy around the 10 absences. Now, I'm not sure if it's a may or shall, the student can fail a class. Is it, if it's a, is it a may or is it a shall? Because it is my understanding that we do have a teacher that automatically fails the student. And so, again, to me, if it's happening one place, it might be happening another, and it could be unintentional. Unexcused absence or any? Just 10 absences, and I don't know what the policy reads. We can, we can look so at that So we need you. to look at the policy. I don't think we've looked at it, but that's happening, and so that's another relationship, I'm sure, a correlation to chronic absenteeism. When you already feel that you're out, you know, you can have a problem. But again, I give you this information for us to explore it again and just clarify. Sometimes we have people coming in and they, they may not know the interpretation of something. So um, please look into that. Another sad thing, and trust me, I, I go to work and I, I'm not looking for these things, but they do trust and come to me and I think it'll be beneficial to the, bit, to the, the district. But we have promoted the promise agreement at Cal State and I'm, I was saddened to hear, um, and there's two specific students, one student that ended up at the last minute having to go to school out of state because there was some paperwork that to me probably would be, would be simple. But what was even worse is that one of the students was one of our Making Hope Happen students. And I, I know we, we're supposed to have mentors with them, right? And so this student and their parent didn't really I guess have all the details that was needed. And thankfully that one student is at Valley College. I'm happy about that because I'm a proud alumni of a Valley College as well. But when we say, you know, there's a promise or something like that, and there's not this goes back to engagement with the community. They hear promise. Promise means it's gonna happen no matter what, even if I'm not clear on my paperwork. So I want us to revisit that. I know Cal State has had some changes in, in a particular department that, that kind of oversights that. But I just felt bad for those students because that's two that I know of. We want them you know, to stay here, but the one situation, I'm so happy that they immediately had to fly out of town to another school that still had the opportunity to enroll within a week period. And that student wanted to stay here. So you know, I can give you more details on it, but again, it's more about making sure that our parents are aware. We have. A parent could be a teacher, a parent could be a principal. It doesn't mean we know everything. We need to understand and have those supports, and we, we highly said that we would have those supports there and available for the Making Hope Happen uh, students. And then I, I attended a conference, and I hope you guys eventually will be able to attend the wellness conference. It's a great, great conference to attend, but just to mention one thing that they were talking about mental health a lot of areas around mental health, and I saw an email from the district about a relationship with NAMI or something to that, that level, but what was good about it is that we talked about that um, in the desert last week, and some, a lot of the districts are having stigma-free lunch times for their students, and they said that they're finding a lot of success because the res resources are being brought on the campus during that time, and the students are really accessing it, so that may be something that we can look into, and then lastly, Part of the presentation um, also, I thought perhaps when we, Dr. Hill brought up the correlation on the suspensions, but ho hopefully you can also add the Ds and Fs in those correlations that were they happening at those schools. Is it the same schools with the high suspensions as well as the Ds and Fs? And that would give us a, another uh, focus on trying to close the gap on those that are, that are struggling with the Ds and Fs and getting suspended. I mean, it's, it's very easy people to lose momentum. These are students we're talking about. The first D, the first F, and if you ever got one in your life, I'm sure it wasn't a happy thing. And so our students are the same way. And then lastly, Dr. Um, Marsden, I had someone tell me a couple of days ago that they were part of the um, Making Hope Happen, uh, Hope Makers, you know, way back when, 
and they didn't get a T-shirt, so oh, they, they they wanted we'll me to, to tell you that that. they want Make their sure you t-shirts. get the name to me. I will get the name oh. to you. All right, thank you. Those are my comments. Thank you. And I just wanted to point out that you did go over five minutes, which is oh, good. Yeah. They didn't say time. It's okay. It's like two minutes after. We're like, okay, you can take my... It's okay. I'll be brief before I head um, to the others. I just want to piggyback on what Mr. Tillman mentioned regarding... Um, efficiency, especially with um, energy and so forth, if we can also make sure that we're recycling and if we can have bins at all of our school sites, um, here at the board meetings, especially in the back room, so that way we're we're recycling appropriately um, the bottles and everything else. Okay, Um, Dr. Hill. Thank you, I'll be brief as well. Uh, I just want to say to uh, Dr. Marsden cabinet Thank you so much. Uh, I've heard every school that I've talked to, and I'm not sitting home calling schools, but the ones I've talked to, they've been very pleased with their opening day yesterday. And we know it's because of your leadership here and just want to thank you so much for what you're doing. I also want to thank uh, Ms. Antiveros and Dr. Volkmer. They are part of the California, this is our first California Clean Air Day which will be October 3rd, so we'll get flyers out to you. And with the schools, uh, with Ms. Ms. Antiveros, we working on some neat things that's gonna make you proud of us. I wanna say thanks to all the parents and the students out there, have a good year, and to make sure you have a good year, don't wait until the end of the semester to check on whether it's a good year or not. Uh, it's okay to check weekly. And of course, to our staff, give our students the best that you have to offer. And if you can't give them the best you have offered, I heard Manny Scott say the other day, perhaps you're in the wrong profession. So uh, uh, to, to all the staff members, we just want to say thank you for all the good things you're doing. And Dr. Marsden, and I understand Ms. Christakos was responsible for Manny Scott coming here. I tell you, I cannot go one day without reliving some of his words and comments. The sad part about that, it wasn't a mandatory event for all staff members, because I tell you, if there are staff members who show up every day just to get a paycheck, I can guarantee you they would not be working for this district today because his message was so powerful that uh, if you have a conscience at all, and I believe we all do, you would walk away from not giving students your best. So I hope the day comes that we can get Manny Scott to come back and present to all staff members. Absolutely wonderful. I think it's the best speaker I've heard in 40 years. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hill? I mean, Dr. Flores? Thank you, Madam President. Um, I also want to welcome everybody back. Uh, I know some of the staff members have not left. They've been on board, but you've had, I hope you had good vacations and you're very raring to go again. Um, and uh, I think we have uh, tremendous um, teachers and, and administrators. And like Dr. Hill says, they want to do the, great, the greatest job possible. Um, I'm so excited because I also got to to take my granddaughter to school, uh, kindergarten, <laughs> and she loved it. And I asked her uh, what her day was like. She goes, "Do I get to go back there tomorrow?" <laughs> uh, yeah. I said, "Yeah, for the rest of the year." <laughs> and uh, she's at Belvedere, yeah. So and she's in a dual uh, language, language. Um, program there, and. Uh, You know how I taught all the teachers, right? Well, I taught her teacher too, 20 years ago. Can you imagine? So that's amazing. So I'm really happy. Um, So I have a few things. Uh, I would, uh, just to follow up on what Mr. Tillman said, I had it on my list too, uh, because uh, I think it's tremendous that we're doing the the parking um, structures with the solar panels and so forth, and I think we should do it throughout our whole district, at every school, at every single school, and plan it, you know, incrementally. I don't know where the money comes from or, or, or what it is. Uh, I think they invest the money, and then uh, they get their return from us paying the, the electric bill, right? So it doesn't cost us any money, uh, by the way. It, 
board members. It doesn't, is that correct? Yeah, and we, we did not have any, we have no escalator, so there is a rate, a flat rate that was very low that we were paying probably below what we are currently what we're paying. Learning. But we don't invest and in the structures they do, right? right. The, 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 That's correct. So I think it's a power it's purchase a, agreement. Right, it's a win-win. So I think we should do it at every single uh, school. Um, and I also have the idea, because parents have told me there aren't enough shaded areas in, in elementary schools for lunch. So we should have those structures, the lunch uh, structures uh, at schools, uh, for example, Gomez, uh, Urbita, um, uh, even, even Belvedere. They need shaded areas, Vermont, uh, so that, uh, and so if it doesn't cost us anything, we should really entertain, I mean, to help our kids so they have, uh, uh, you know, shade to eat their lunches in. And also when it rains, uh, they could be out there. So that was my uh, contribution. Secondly, uh, following up on what uh, Ms. Rogers said, I would like to agendize uh, Madam President for next uh, board meeting to bring uh, Dr. Greg Spencer to give us an update on um, Footsteps to Brilliance and uh, where he thinks, uh, you know, what we've done and where, where we need to go. And I know that one of our teachers, Talika, I forgot Talika's last name. Do you remember? You don't remember Ms. Rogers? She was a teacher that worked the summer uh, with Footsteps for Brilliance, and the kids did tremendously. They gained so tremendously. So I, I really want to hear about that. Uh, so um, I would like to agendize that so, okay. and invite uh, Dr. Spencer to come. Also, um, I'm glad I, I spoke to Ms. Christakos uh, about air conditioning, and I and I didn't hear back from the people that called me, and uh, so I think it was taken care of. So that's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I have gotten reports of overcrowding in classrooms. Uh, I won't mention the high schools, but I'll tell you later, uh, where there's 48 students in a class. That's unacceptable, totally unacceptable. Uh, K uh, one two combos forty two kids uh, in a classroom that is unacceptable. Uh, our and and uh, um, Dr. Marsden, I know we have the twenty day or whatever, but our kids shouldn't be and our teachers shouldn't be under that stress. We should and I know we have extra teachers. What do we call them? Uh, itinerant uh, teachers. Resident subs. Resident mm -hmm. subs that could be hired and uh, not the resident subs no they're uh teachers that what do we call them uh dr wiseman um we've hired them but they're uh they're not residents because they have uh they're on emergencies i think correct itinerant teachers would itinerant. Be, those right. would be housed right. kind of at the district and we deploy them right um, and if we have the numbers, then we should hire them. Yeah, if the numbers are there. Uh, that's what I, I know you, you wait, but I don't think we should be waiting. That's 20 days, that's a month. And uh, it's a, our, our kids are losing yeah, and, out. And Dr. Forrest, just so you know, we're not waiting. You're not waiting? Uh, not at all. You're acting on it? Uh, every day. Every day? Mm -hmm. Every single As day? As we have the last few years. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I'm getting these reports. Every year. Mm -hmm. All right. Because we well, can't we can't predict where kids are going to show up, so right. we have to respond. Right. And that's what we're doing. Well, I'm getting reports, also middle schools. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Thank you. These are teachers. They call me. Sure. They text me, Great. and, and, and so let forth. us know, and we'll right. get the team right. on it right away. Right. I think we have to act. And yeah. lastly, <clears throat> I'd like to know. I know you're. I know. We're, I, I heard Dr. Monadis talk about a wellness community uh, meeting or a committee. Uh, have we set up the dates and times where that committee is going to be meeting? Because I, I got some inquiries from community members, and I didn't Dr. know Flores, the dates. Dr. Flores, are you referring to the wellness symposium that's going to take place in October? And that's so there's a committee that is preparing all of that? And I, is it from the community? It's a combination, yes. So we oh, have yeah, they want to join. They want, is it too late to join or come? Um, I, Dr. Perez, is it too late? I don't think so. 
So we were happy to take the names and reach out to okay, the community. I'll give you, there's yeah. a couple of names We that have reached um, out to me. We have ongoing meetings. Thank we still you. have several of them planned, uh -huh. so we would be happy to have. Okay. So we'll get those names from you. I just got the Thank request you. today. Perfect. And I didn't know um, We'd be happy if to we reach had out. it. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. Thank give you. it to you. The name? Okay. All right, thank, thank you, Dr. Thank Flores. you, that's it. And Dr. Wyatt? Well, I was going to say I was going to keep it short, but uh, why start now? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so for those of you out there being very patient with us, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Tom Pace and Joe Aceto today for a wonderful visit to our new theater here at Indian Springs High School. Wow, um, amazing facility. I can't wait for our first event. and. Uh, I just found out, I guess we're going to be having our board meetings there, too, so that's pretty exciting. I was just looking forward to seeing students there, so mm. I get to look forward to seeing these folks now, so just kidding. Um, but no, really, really fantastic facility, and uh, uh, something that Tom was telling me, you know, it's uh, pretty much paid for free and clear, and I think that's pretty amazing when we look at facilities such as that and multi-million dollar projects that our, our district, when we look at our finances and how we manage our money, that's, that's pretty impressive that you know, we didn't have to go to the city for that or to the public or to the community, but it was sponsored by our developers. So I think that's really important to share with our community to let them know that uh, such an amazing theater um, was constructed and paid for by the developers that work with our community. So again, fantastic job. Um, great reports today. You know, I, I wanna always try to reflect on the previous year as we move forward into our new year and uh, just some items that uh, come to mind, uh, graduation rates that have been going up uh, obviously, suspension rates going down, which is important. Our Safe Routes to Schools uh, program that's getting ready to start up and get fired up, and I know that's been one we've been waiting for for quite some time, so really excited about that. Citations tremendously down. I know we've talked about that already earlier, and it goes back to the school-to-prison pipeline and um, keeping our kids from going to places like juvenile hall or county jail or prison as they get older. So, so phenomenal work there, and I know um, you know, uh, Chief Donahue as well as Chief Polino text me, it, it is a, it's a group effort, it really is. It takes everyone to manage to get those citations down and work with our students, keep them in school, get them in school where they could be successful. Um, chronic absenteeism, we, we know that's a huge challenge. It's one of our areas of accountability on our, our dashboard that we're responsible for. Um, one item that really stuck out to me, and it's an area that I work in, uh, is our continuation schools and how do we get that percentage of students down. You know, that, that's something that um, I think we really need a, a specific strategy and a plan of intervention and support to address. Because obviously if our chronic absenteeism number is pretty high, part of it could be because our conti continuation schools are in the 80s. I mean, that's a high, high percentage when we look at that. So um, I know our continuation schools have some phenomenal programs, as Mr. Gallo mentioned earlier. So. I don't think it's the educational programs or what we offer there, but obviously other circumstances, as we know with our students that they face at home, um, on the way to school, maybe you know what they have to take care of at home or they're working. So how do we support them? Um, I know I was looking over at Dr. Manada's over here and said, is there some sort of blended program we could have um, in regards to an instructional um, model to where we could collect that ADA on them? You know, maybe a combination of, you know, traditional comprehensive school with like an independent study model. Because a lot of our kids, and those of you that are familiar with independent study programs know that it's a different attendance model and how we collect attendance and revenue. And that's something that could possibly benefit our students as well as the district. Because, yeah, it'd be a hybrid program or some sort of blended instruction program that I think we could investigate and look at to really work with that specific population. Because I mean, when you look at the percentage of chronic absenteeism, that is huge, you know, and we have to do something different there. Because obviously, you know, I've been looking at the number for a few years now and it hasn't really changed. So what can we do better as a district to better serve our students to meet their needs, as we would always say, because it's obvious that what we're doing is not working there. And so I know we're pretty innovative and I think we could do a great job on creating something different, maybe even be a model for others to emulate as we've done on so many other items. So um, I know, well, Dr. Forrest passed me this little note. Kind of goes along with our, our new performing arts theater and, uh, and I did look in our notes, Dr. Forrest, on our, she, she's really passionate so am I about our mariachi band. Um, and that actually is in our, our follow-up items. I, I noticed on 
uh, number six on educational services, and that's Dr. Mitchell, and and uh, I'm sure we'll get some updates on that maybe in a little bit, and that'd be great. And I got 18 Yes, I seconds. have a uh, BC coming to the board for the next board meeting. That is awesome. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. So we're looking forward to that, and definitely them performing in our new theater right behind us here would be exciting. So that's it for me. Welcome back, uh, students, staff, parents. Uh, looking forward to another dynamic, incredible year and to build upon the great successes we've already achieved and established and proud to serve you all. All right, thank you so much. And we just heard the bell as well. So Dr. Dr. Marsden. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, first, just want to start us off with some student recognitions. Uh, this, if you didn't see it, this year's Inland Empire Magazine featured the top 25 football recruits from the Inland Empire region. Four of those students are students right here in San Bernardino City Unified. So congratulations to Jaden Daniels, Darren Jones, Jonathan Perkins, and Cameron Stevens, all from Cajon High School. So have a great season and an even better school year. Excited for all of them. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I too was very excited. I went from uh, Pakum Elementary School yesterday and then drove over to Lincoln Elementary School and then went to Kendall a little later and today at uh, San Bernardino High School. And everybody is just off to an absolutely great start. Uh, every parent everywhere very excited for their children. It was a pleasure to see uh, so many folks on the first day. Um, and then uh, teacher professional development series, as you know, occurred over the summer uh, last uh, last week. With uh, we began last week with two full days of professional development for three th thirty five hundred excuse me fifteen hundred elementary and secondary teachers at the Ontario Convention Center with a targeted focus around math instruction. Uh, the keynote speaker for, for the first day uh, was Phil Darrow, who is a writer of the Common Core uh, State Standards in Math. And then the second day was Doug Reeves, who spoke to all of our secondary team. Uh, he was very well attended. As you know, he's working with us directly on grading practices. Probably the two most powerful speakers <laughs> in the universe of public education we're in front of our folks for those two days and nothing but positive feedback from all. And then, as was said earlier, the employee gathering followed on the first. Thank you, board, for, for those that were able to make that. Uh, Manny Scott, as you know, was a Freedom Rider at Long Beach Unified, uh, movie made out for the Freedom Riders. And his message was very inspiring to all of us to be hope. Uh, he actually uh, talked with me just briefly before the event and said that he really felt like this was home for him because he understood uh, that this community is so much like the community he grew up in. And then, board, I have a couple requests of you. I need a, a couple of you, uh, three if you could please, to be on a subcommittee as we look at this talk, topic of programs of excellence. We have some ideas we want to uh, um, navigate with you uh, in terms of uh, adding additional programs like Richardson or Rodriguez. And so we're getting close to some ideas and we would like to have your help on that uh, as we begin to prepare a January presentation to the board on that. So do we have a couple of volunteers that could help just kind of vet a few ideas that helps us to be most prepared when we present to the board in January? So we have Dr. Wyatt and uh, Dr. Gallo, Mr. Gallo. Uh, and one more? Do I have one more that might be interested? For schools like Richardson or Rodriguez, more about programs of excellence and creating additional opportunities for parents and students. I could be part of it, but I don't know. Uh, Thank you. If we'll we'll schedule Forrest, a time to get to you to be a part of that. Oh, I remember you and Dan. Yes, we were the ones. Yep, so that that's great. And then what I'll do is maybe have Dr. Flores as an alternate. I'll, I'll awesome. Thank you, Dr. Flores. And then, thank you. And then, board, my, my last request of you, if I could ask your attention for just a moment. Um, on Tuesday, I would like to request uh, that we have the uh, final superintendent evaluation meeting for the, the formal meeting itself with Dr. Yee on Tuesday, October 30th. And then I wanted to ask if you had a time frame that works best for all of us, or most of us, uh, for, for about, I, I'm thinking three hours should do it. Uh, we finished between two and three hours, so if we could uh, set that time aside, you, what what time will work for you? Dale, you don't think uh, October 31st would be more of an appropriate <laughs> date? I'll be busy. I'll be in costume. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so so w could we make that day work? So so Miss Medina and uh, Miss Rogers, Mr. Tillman. 
What what time would you like to hold those three hours from when to so when? So I can I can only after. Let me see here. Uh, it would be five thirty and on, unfortunately. So starting at five thirty and we'll go to eight thirty. Okay. Okay. So Lord, may we go ahead and schedule that then with Doctor Yi? Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And then just uh, a couple more things to mention. One, uh, if you are interested in joining, you know there's this national lip sync, ch lip sync challenge going on for police. If you're interested in joining our district school police in this, uh, Tuesday, August 21st at 4.45 p.m., let uh, Ms. Bardeer will share a few comments about that for you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Marsden. Our outstanding district police department has requested our video team to produce a lip sync challenge video, and they would like to welcome the Board of Education members to participate. So the idea is at about 445, prior to the start of the August 21st meeting, we will shoot an opening scene with our uh, Police Officers Association uh, president, who's going to be the lead lip syncer. And we'll welcome either President Medina or any other board member who would like to take the speaking part of the video, which is, in essence, just asking for a report from our Police Officers Association, just as you do at virtually every meeting. Okay, so I would that's the concept, do. and we hope you'll be open to participating. Okay, sounds great. Thank you, Linda. And also, uh, to compliment uh, Linda's team, this week the district is launching its first Hope News on the district's website with a spotlight on the first day of school at Pakuma and the Employee Gathering for Excellence. So I, I ask them to play just maybe about 30 seconds of the video, I think it's like a six minute video, but just maybe 30 seconds or so, so the board gets a sense. And you'll be able to view this later on your social media or other, other website. I'm Linda Bardeer, and welcome to the inaugural edition of Hope News on the Hope News Network. Today is the first day of the 2018-19 school year, and Superintendent Dr. Del Marsden kicked off the year. So there you go. There's just a little teaser, and we'll ask you to pull it up on your social media and watch it later. We're excited about this, and we're excited that we'll start later even getting students involved, and, and you'll see some great, great pieces through that. So thank you, Linda, and your team for that work. And thank you, board. Those are my comments. All right. Thank you, Dr. Marsden. Hope News. Hope News. All right. We're going to go ahead and move to 8.0, consent calendar, 8.1, <coughs> approval of minutes. No. Yep. No, no. This is, I'm sorry. Did I, did I do the wrong one? The consent. Okay. I'll move to approval of the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Which ones are we going to pull? And I need to pull 8 point, I don't need to pull it, but I need to step out for 8.22. It's a ratification. So we'll pull 8.22 as well. So yeah, okay. whatever you want to yeah. do. Yeah. Is that it? Okay, let's go ahead and call for the vote. All's in favor? Aye. All's opposed? Okay, go ahead. And uh, we're gonna go to 8.9. Uh, yes, I would just like clarification. Uh, I thought we passed uh, one last time for uh, leadership associates. Turn that to Mrs. Uh, Christakos. Yes, we have, if you'll notice there, we owe an amount of $1,600 from last year. Um, we asked him to serve an extra day with us at Cabinet Strategic uh, Quarterly. And so it's just to be able to pay that invoice from last year. Just the $1,600? Oh, okay. All right. Oh, I didn't notice the date. I thought it was another one. Okay. Thank you. So moved. Any discussion? Okay, let's go ahead and call for the vote. But before I do, I just wanted, I didn't read it. So it's ratification of amendment number one to the amendment with leadership associates, LLC, La Quinta, California, to provide executive coaching services. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay, motion carried. Let's go to 8.19. Um, I would also like to ask, uh, I know that this is over uh, five years, um, 
And I'd like to ask if we have uh, a uh, evaluation in place uh, because this is over a million dollars and over five years. So uh, Dr. Marston, I'd yes. like to know if we um, have in place evaluation. Yes, we do for all all programs and contracted services now, correct? Mm -hmm. That's So what I would like to know how this is working Okay. In all of our schools. Sure. We can get that back uh, to you. In, in terms of, because um, I know it's a good program. Uh, I'm not questioning it. Mm -hmm. I just like to know the uh, effect that it's having sure. with our kids. We'd be uh, happy to yeah, get that so, too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, and that's amendment number one to the agreement with mm -hmm. installation, I Dallas, California. Ice I station. I Ice station. Yeah. yeah iStation Dallas, California, to provide a software license, subscription, and professional development. Dallas, so moved. Texas, yes. Okay. Uh, there was a second. Is there any discussion for the discussion? If not, let me go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, motion carried. Then 8.22, which is a ratification and renewal agreement with Technical Employment Training, Inc., San Bernardino, California, to provide advanced manufacturing STEM pathway to district school sites. So moved. Second. Any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, motion carried. Let's go to... We can bring, we can bring your other members back. Yes, if we can bring the school board members. I also want to start with uh, 9.0 action items, 9.1 personnel report, number three, dated August 7th, 2018. As presented. Okay. So moved. Any discussion? Um, a lengthy one. Is this the personnel okay, all report? Aye. <laughs> Aye. All right. All those no, she hasn't all called. Those, I have to say all, all of those. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Motion carried. Okay. 9.2, approval of the college readiness block grant plan 2017-2018. Any discussion? None. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed? Okay, motion carried. 9.3, 45 day revision after adoption of governor's budget fiscal year 2018 19. The motion? So let me go ahead and read it. Um, be resolved that the Board of Education approves the inclusion and of the revisions in the budgeting and revenues and expenditures in order to meet the 45-day revision requirements to fiscal year 2018-19 per Education Code Section 42127H as presented. And uh, any discussion? Okay, we already have a first and we have a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, motion carried. Let's go to, is it 9.5? Four, amendment to board policy 5117, interdistrict attendance, students, second reading. Board, is there any? Well, let me go ahead and call for the motion. Second. Okay, and then let me finish the rest. Be it resolved that the Board of Education adopts the amendments of board policy 5117, interdistrict attendance. Uh, let's go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, motion carried. 9.5 new board policy 5131.2 bullying students second reading. Be it resolved that the Board of Education adopts the new board policy 5131.2 bullying students um, second reading. So let's have a motion. Second. Any discussion? If not, let's go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, motion carried. 9.6, board ongoing initiatives. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed? Okay, motion carried. 9.7, top 10. Okay, any discussion? I see none. Let's go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, motion carried. 9.8 follow up. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Say aye. All those opposed say nay. 
Key motion carried, 9.9, .9. future agenda items. Okay, any discussion? Not, let's go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. Motion carried. And then we have 10.0 summary of board requests by Dr. Volkmer. As presented. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have quite a long list. Uh, oh. We'll go through them as quickly as I can. Uh, in terms of um, uh, presentation on, returning with a presentation on just chronic absenteeism, that would include uh, any correlation between chronic absences and health concerns as well as disaggregated data by level, elementary school, middle school, high school, as well as gender, and be sure to include raw numbers and percentages. Um, there was a request to have the board recognize schools who have had significant drops in suspension rates. Um, staff needs to follow up in terms of um, clarifying if we lose the ADA for in-house suspensions. So we'll get that back to you. Uh, there's a request for a three to five year summary on positive tickets and how we've been doing in that area in terms of uh, increasing the number of positive um, interactions with students. Prepare a mediated structure matrix for all schools um, uh, with that a, a variety of data points. African American suspension rate uh, provided school by school with the actual demographic, including the demographics of that per each particular school. Um, uh, susp additional suspension data are, uh, for e all of the middle schools. Explore the, exp uh, the um, expansion of our solar activities as a follow-up. Um, in terms of working with our counselors, make sure that we have what I, I termed, I hope this is the right term, scheduling awareness. An example being that if a student is in two pathways, they might not be able to uh, have their core classes to continue to be A to G and college ready. Double check the 10 absence policy and how it relates to uh, grades or grading. Um, make sure that we're communicating well and par uh, parents have clear awareness of our San Bernardino promise and the details of that partnership. Uh, what is the correlation, uh, going back to suspensions, what is the correlation uh, with uh, suspension rates and DNFs, Ds and Fs? Um, Mrs. Rogers is going to provide the name to Dr. Marsden for a Hope Maker t-shirt for someone. We don't know who that person she is. Did. She did. Yeah, he already has it. Yeah. Checking that one off right now, thank you. Uh, as well as exploring a recycling uh, program that came up as well in addition mm -hmm. to expanding our solar program. Uh, look at lunch structures uh, for shade uh, for at our various schools. Um, Ms. Dr. Flores requested uh, to, that we agendize an update on foot, the progress of Footsteps to Brilliance. I got, yeah, that's what I meant by expansion of solar. Oh, got it, yep, mm -hmm. thank you. But thank you for that reminder. Um, Dr. Flores is going to provide, oh my goodness, what does that say? Oh, the, the classes where the overages are. Yeah, specific, this, that's it, specific about um, our class overages. Perry, Dr. Wiseman. Um, investigate uh, the possibility of some type of hybrid program, maybe a combination of regular program and independent study for students experiencing chronic absenteeism. And then the last one that I have is um, uh, give a report on the eventual progress of the iStation software. Okay. Let's go ahead and call the meeting to uh, adjourn. It's 11.0 adjournment. Can I have a motion? Okay. Okay. Mo Board meeting adjourned. And I do want to mention that it's 9.05, and uh, we have a projected time at 9 o'clock, so we did by five minutes go over, but considering the fact that we did have a long discussion with good report, so we did great. Thank you. Thank you.